Okay, so I'm super excited to have you on the show. And I'm excited to be I'm here. Super fucking excited. So I'm, gonna, but uh, but you know, I feel like Dave because I'm a comic. Are we have we started? We're starting. This okay. Is, can, no I, can I say one thing? Yes. Please, uh, this is my idea of what like a successful metro Hollywood couple's apartment would look like. <laughs> Lots of brick, you know, right? yes. forest, not much furniture, but of course a movie light in the corner. <laughs> I like that. The and mountains, the, and the, yeah, the view, the view, the, and, and also the movie light when I bought it. I was like, this is kind of a hacky light, but I, I bought it anyway. <laughs> okay, I bought it anyway. I like it. I um, like it. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Uh, because I'm a comic, I feel like I feel like there's a handful of guys who are like literally like in the comedy firmament. I mean, there's the there's like the there's like the old guys that are practically dead. There's like the priors that's me. and the that's not oh, you. No, that's like the priors the and the Murphys, the legends. And then right of them is like Attell and like Gould and like you're 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 right there. You're like uh, like well, like a, like a mid level constellation. So I'm very excited to have you on the show. A low cloud formation. Yeah, but a good one, a, like a cumulus, like yes, a massive a cumulus. cumulus. Yeah, the kind um, you make wishes to. When you yeah, you know, or you trying to get laid. Look at that pretty cloud trying to act as. If you're sensitive, sure. Yeah, that too. All right. But but the point is, I don't know anything about you. Yeah, Dave. I know. We've never really met. In the We've comedy. never met ever. Where did you start doing comedy? San Francisco. Okay, so there you go. So yeah. I started in New York. You started in San Francisco. Yeah. Probably by the time I was like, uh, I would play the punchline. I was just up there playing cops. But yeah, we started doing the punchline. That was like one of the first places where we got to headline. Uh, you probably had already moved to L.A. or That seems that? about right. Okay. I might have already moved out. Yeah. yeah I so never. Do you was one town ahead of me. What's that? I don't know. About this. I was <laughs> fleeing you specifically. Okay. Do Not the first. You right. feel, and I had to flee because you never, no one ever takes you, uh, maybe you don't feel this way. I always feel like no one ever takes you seriously in the town that you start in because they remember when you sucked. Like right. they were, but New York yeah. is a big enough town that maybe that doesn't happen as much there. Yeah, New York, New York is like not so much about like uh, like a lot of my friends started in uh, San Francisco. Tom Rhodes, yeah, you know he's one of the big acts oh, there. Yeah. He's great. And uh, you know I just work with Larry Bubbles Brown, who's oh, you know, Bubbles. Is he still list. doing stand up? Is he? Oh boy, I mean, is he? <laughs> <laughs> Was he ever? Yeah, he did. Hey, what's up? No, he, he, I love he's him. A lot of fun. I love him. And there's like some great San Francisco acts. I guess Jake Johansson, yeah, San Francisco act. Uh, Jake you know. Barron. Rhodes, uh, fucking well. I mean, Marin wasn't from San Francisco, but I always feel like he was yeah, a San he Francisco there, act, right? Yeah, yeah, that was one of his towns. But I never really lived Patton there. Patton and Blaine and uh, yeah, all those guys. Okay. Brian Bussain, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good. It was a good scene. Those yeah. guys all started around when I did. Okay, so yeah. there was a lot more places to play in San Francisco than they just closed the uh, Purple Onion or whatever. Yeah, it was. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and the, what was the other the zoo. The Purple Onion? That was where Galifianakis did a special there, and there was the zoo. And then what was that other? The zoo was where I did my very first set. Oh, it was really? where I got oh. my very first paid set. Okay. But remember that other place? It was like the end, West End or the half, the half Turn. It was like a place out in like kind of the sunset. Mm. They used to do a lot of improv there. The, uh, I, I, yeah, really the Bottoms Up. I don't know. Some <clears> fucking <throat> shitty name. San Francisco was a great town. The the uh, the comedy was so cool. The crowds are great. Smart. And also, it's like a fun town. Like yeah. sometimes you play these towns on the road. You know, misery. Where you're like, uh, you know, there's nothing to do. San Francisco. There was always a lot of fun, a lot of drink, a lot of party. Right. So I always love going there. And uh, one of the greatest shows I ever had there was with Mitch Hedberg, who was yeah. opening for me. Yeah. And uh, the late great Mitch Hedberg, who's you know amazing he comic, died. Uh, gone and forever. I yeah. think. Yeah. But. Uh, he um, opened for me, and I said to the people, I'm like, why is this guy opening for me? He should be headlining. And then he became a headliner. So right, right. I would like to be, I'm the last guy he ever middled for. So. <laughs> you're, the, you're, the, you're the last uh, the last heterosexual relationship he had before he turned gay. Or maybe the other way around. Something something, something like that. that. Right. I, I heard your you phone beep. Can we turn, level, is it, is it your phone or is it my phone? Somebody's phone beeped. Let's make it. That was my heart. I'm your heart. <laughs> old. I have a pacemaker, so. <laughs> uh, I, I'm prepared me. to give you a CPR. Perfect. Did you. Get the um, paddles out. <laughs> I'm just going to do that thing never that fake thing. shit get movies the where they just out. pound on your chest with their fist yeah, like it's never going to help anybody get the paddles out and we're going to go canoeing <laughs> or kayaking or, you know we're going to play a little ping pong before dinner go were ahead. you sorry no 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 it's, this it's is rare your, that you get to this is your hour super cool person so <laughs> this you. is your this is your we're going to do this that my this hour? hour yeah this okay. is your hour my moment did you always want to be a comic no, actually, uh, you know, I'm not a really good performer for those of you people who, out there who've seen my act. <laughs> I, uh, I was a very stiff, um, nervous, no self confidence guy for, I'd say, about six or seven years into the comedy scene. And I did a lot of comedy. I mean, like every open mic in New York, I was yeah. all over it. And, uh, you know, for me, it was like I really embraced the rejection, dejection, and um, def- 
defeat of it yeah. because I kind of came from that like background. I was never good at anything, so right. it felt right to me. And the people you get to hang out with, especially in the open mic when you're first starting out, everybody's like new. Everybody's kind of bad, but not bad, and everybody's really fun. Like yeah. everybody, like you know, it's like finally you find people who are, like fun to talk to. So yeah. Well, there's a, there's it. a nice. It, it's enjoyable, I think, at that level, especially to commiserate with fellow comics. You know, yeah. you're all in the same boat. Everybody sucks. Mm-hmm. I remember you, I used to come out of like these. There's this place in San Francisco that had like it was like a fucking la- like a laundromat. Yeah. And it's all it's all comics. There are no real people in the audience. Like you yeah. know, twenty comics and like three people doing their laundry. That's oh. why I walk out of there and be like. It would be funny. It was like, I did not get one laugh in there. Like, and it would be, even thinking about it, it was funny because it was just so miserable. There was, it was so abject mm-hmm. that there was a comedy to it. But do you feel like, I feel like that was made, made you tough. Like, those terrible sets made you funny because they made you impervious. Well, it definitely killed me inside. So <laughs> any feelings I had left were dead. But yeah, I, I think the first couple of years are good because I don't think it's so much true now because there's a lot of social media people connect, right. you know, not so much in person, but through the uh, web and all that. Mm-hmm. But it was really good for, uh, you know, like to learn how to handle a bad crowd, to learn how to handle like, uh, you know, the heckling and all that stuff. And uh, to be honest, I kind of sucked for like years and years and years. And I didn't really deserve to get paid, you know, <laughs> up until almost I did Letterman. I think, you know, I, I would say it's debatable whether I, you know, I wasn't getting paid either. So, you know, they give you like, you know, I think back then it was like 10 bucks, which was supposed to be cap fair. Right. Like at the comedy cellar, which is like one of the places where like I was uh, rejected at first and then I got uh, passed uh, about a year later, they would give you a meal and like some food, and like that was kind of the pay, you know. Right, right, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, do you, was there was there a moment? Because someone just asked me this question, and I and it was the first time that everybody asked me, and then I thought it was kind of interesting. Was there a moment when you felt like you had it figured out? Oh, I never really feel like I have it figured out. I do know what I want to do, and like right. uh, you know, in my mind, because you know, the people that like really influenced me both alive and dead were like, you know, Colin Quinn and uh, Alan Havey, who... Uh, Colin you know, is going to be really upset to find out he's dead. No, no, I, I was going to say, <laughs> these are the living the ones. living ones. <laughs> Plus the guys that I started with, you know, yeah. uh, you know, like my favorites, like a Doug Stanhope or mm-hmm. a Lucy C.K. and, yeah. you know, like uh, a lot of really great guys. And then there's the dead ones, of course, which are the, uh, you know... Uh, the Bill Hicks and mm-hmm. Sam Kinison, you know, and everybody always says Richard Pryor, but I never saw him live. But right. I did get to see Bill Hicks live many mm-hmm. times, and mm-hmm. that, was, that was like a high point for me. Bill and was like actually, a transcendent performer. Yeah, I, he was a San Francisco actor. Yeah, too. yeah, he played all over the country, and San Francisco was one of his like. He was hits. like his home mm-hmm. base. He Bill was one of those guys that made you ashamed of like all, everything you wrote. Yes, like everything you wrote, you're like or even I'm, thought. Yeah, exactly. like I don't even yeah. have good ideas. And I have poor ideas, poorly executed. Whenever you'd watch Bill, you'd be like, I can't even, yeah. I was hanging out with him one time after a show at the New York Improv, which is no longer uh, going Mm -hmm. anymore. But uh, he came over a guy's house, and, like, you know, we were all getting high, but he was already sober. And he saw there was a guitar, and he goes, hey, can I uh, try that guitar? And he was, like, a master guitar player. Just, like, uh, like, uh, just great. And you were like, wow, what can't this guy do? I mean, like, he's so talented. Good at everything. He had a bravery, too. Is that why you admired him? Because I feel like of all the guys that... There are guys you admire because they're writers. Your guys admire because they're performance style. But I feel like Bill had this bravery, even different than Sam's, because I feel like Sam would just kind of ram it down your throat. But sometimes it was kind of blunt force. I always felt like Bill was brave, and he was craft. Like his work was crafty. Yeah, uh, that's a really good point because I like Bill for two reasons. One was uh, he was an amazing joke writer, and when you first start out, you realize the hardest thing ever is writing oh, yeah. a joke. And the way he would just connect the dots on some of this stuff, it was just, it was genius. And then I also like him for the fact that even though he's considered an alternative comic now, like kind of the, one of the forefathers of the alt scene, Mm -hmm. he would play like bumfuck in the, you know, like all these like crazy off the grid clubs, you know, the chain clubs, Mm -hmm. the mall clubs, all the clubs that I played, Mm -hmm. but he was like this all comic and he never, he never would, uh, you know, whatever, uh, he, he he never would would dumb down his material yeah. or his sensibility, and he would fight the crowd every step tooth and nail. And I got to see him on the road one time, and they were not digging him. And it was <laughs> weird because he had already done Letterman uh, multiple times, and like they could care less. They wanted him to just do the three bits that they had heard him do right. on, on something. And he had a lot more to say, and he would just 
fight him. Like it was, it was great. And for me, as a guy who was going out on the road, I was like, wow, that is cool. That is balls. You right, know? right. Because balls. there is that panic, right? We're stepping into a club, you know, in Grand Rapids or yeah. fucking, you know, four. Points or quad <laughs> cities, you know, where, whatever. Yeah, where, where, yeah. Where you just think like these people aren't going to get me, and and I've got to spend an hour with them, and I've got to find a way in, right? Mm-hmm. And he just never cared about finding a way in. He didn't. Yeah. Now on the other end is Sam Kennison, who I think is one of the most underrated great comics who ever lived. Because when you look at comedy now, it's pretty much storytelling and pretty low key, kind of like smooth jazz. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> And I think that's cool for this generation. You know, they're all kind of like hipsters. But uh, back then, like, he was like a force of nature. Yeah. And before the drugs and the fame hit, it was an angry dude who grew up in this, you know, I guess an evangelical world. Yeah. And he was just laying it down and connecting to that, both the evil and the good, and, like, mixing it together. And I really do wish I had seen him live. I never got to see him. Yeah, did no, you? no, I never did. And I... You know, nothing but television. And I I feel like I didn't become like a real consumer of – or even understand it. You know what I mean? Like I feel like I was just a beer drinker for a big part of my life. I just drank like the – you know what I mean? Like in <laughs> terms of my drink? comedy. Huh, what's that? No, no. That I mean, wasn't I'm, your drink. No, what was no. your drink? What bourbon. Drink? I'm a bourbon. Really? Bourbon, bourbon is my – I can see is that. My drink. Yeah. Oh. Um, but right. but in the sense of like, you know, that like what I consumed in the comedy world, it took me a while to like hone my tastes. You know what I mean? Like I mm. think in the beginning I knew the big the big guys and I loved the big guys and it took me a while to find the guys that were underneath there that were like doing interesting shit. Right. You know, like Sam and I never I mean I I think he died before I even really like got like to be like a real Yeah, I really consumer. do think that he would have had a resurgence like especially after he went through like the trial by fire of both right. drugs and to fame get sober. and up and down and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, he's more I guess you could say legend now than he is like relevant because uh there's not that kind of comedy. It's Nobody's really doing correct. that now. You know, no. like that was like balls to the chin in your face. Maybe Stan Hope does something in that well, spirit. Well, that's true. Very good right? point. Stan Hope is a good friend of mine. I would say he's the last, I call him the last Mohegan. He's the one guy who will never go on the reservation. He's right. the last guy right. playing bar shows, people standing up, basically standing and just booze, puke, and piss. <laughs> <laughs> was the name of his last special him. was No Refunds. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I've seen him so many times, you know, like we, we, I guess, first met at the Montreal Comedy Festival. And, uh, you know, Doug and I, like, I always use him as my check, uh, going, am I being a hack? Is this a, is this a hack bit? Is this a hack thing I'm doing? Because if Doug doesn't think it's hack, it's not hack. Right, so, right, yeah. exactly. When you, so when you were a young, what, so what triggered? I was never young, by the you, way. <laughs> never used, born <laughs> this old, born came out with a beard. An old soul, as they say. <laughs> Just came out stroking that beard. Yeah. So you said you you said you didn't always want to be a comic. So what was the thing that drew you to comedy? I well, mean, other than your love of, were you did you grow up like being a lover of comic? Like just I loved listening to comedy albums back then. George Carlin and uh, Rhino Records used to have all that kind of you know like I guess you could call it now like you know, I don't know it'd be like kind of like Adult Swim type you know right. crazy parodies and just sound effects and I would just laugh and laugh. But uh, you know, I, I remember buying Richard Pryor albums like at the mall, and like you know, my mom would be like, "You can pick out one thing," and like, and I would buy the Richard Pryor album, and like, you know, I just couldn't get enough of it. So yeah. I was a fan, but I was not really thinking that that's something I would do. And right. you know, uh, it wasn't until I was after college, almost like right up to the last year, I went to NYU with uh, Adam Sandler, and oh, okay. he already was a comic. And the first road gig I ever did was in Queens with Adam Sandler. I totally died. It was on dance floor at disco. I uh, died a thousand deaths. Uh, he killed. And uh, he was just so likable. I wanted to blame the venue, right? But he, no, I no. couldn't do it. It was me. It was just me, horrible, <laughs> and him, great. And uh, you know, it's funny because when you say like, do you, you know, knowing your voice and all that kind of stuff, he knew almost. I'd say right away, like who he was on stage, what he wanted to do, his plan, and you know, give him a lot of credit. He brought a lot of good people along with him. Yeah, so, he's you know. lo- he's. Bananas loyal. Adam. Yeah, he like, truly is. Yeah, yeah and he remembers. Guy. He'll remember. I mean, we worked together a couple of times, and he's just a guy who just remembers everybody. And he's like, yeah. if I ever have a shot, I'll give it to you. And he's like very, you know, he has a circle of people he tries to. And those guys, even though life. they're film guys, they're they're still at their heart comics. So I think right. you know when they do movies like Funny People and stuff like that, yeah, it's really because they kind of miss the nostalgia of of the whole club, you know, experience the drama, the highs and lows of it and all that kind of stuff. The only thing is uh, you know, they do that movie and then they get back into their helicopter and go <laughs> 
<laughs> to their millionaire island. Right, I can only imagine. I don't know. An island. What do or, I know? Or Whore Island. Millionaire exactly. Island, which is next to Whore Island, just exactly. a little jaunt away. You love that Whore Island. It's I do. So Whore Island. Oh. Who doesn't like Whore Island? Four days, five nights. Super friendly. Mm. Super all inclusive in every way. Sure. Uh, I, we're going to jump around. I, you, I like to go chronologically, but I want to ask you about that. About the, because, you know, when you've been a headliner, as long as you have, mm-hmm. like, one of the reasons we've never met other than we started in different cities and kind of had maybe like you, you know, you're obviously you have much more accomplished than I am, but like parallel trajectories is I feel like you never interact with other headliners ever. Cause you're on the road. Yeah. Cause you're yeah. on the road. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so that, that time, like that seven years or eight years, whatever, that baby comic time where you're with all your peers and you fuck with each other and you give each other tags from the back of the sure. room and you sure. like that goes away. Do you, do you ever experience that anymore? Oh, well that's, that's cool. You brought that up because you know, now that like we've all, most of the guys I know have headlined on their own. You know, I've done a couple of tours with guys, but now I'm on a great tour with uh, Jim Norton, Artie Lang, and we just recently had Amy Schumer, who's oh, super fun. funny. Oh, fun. That's great. great. And it's called the Antisocial Tour, and we just did a gig in uh, Minneapolis, but we've done like variations of the same tour. It's not the blue collar tour. Like, we'll never get to that point <laughs> of like fame and like, I got a lunchbox and there's right, no catchphrase right. or anything. It's, like that. The it's not the like that. It's fucking straws yeah. coming out of it's it. It's just yeah. old dudes <laughs> just basically trying to pay a mortgage selling dick jokes. And, uh, but that's a lot of fun because we get to hang around and we all, you know, like, you know, pretty much are filthy, dirty comics. We yeah. don't fit with anybody else. So, right, you know, right. You know. That's great though because I do feel like. That pa- I have a guy that opens for me, and so I've got like that experience of like somebody I like. I think they're funny. I get, but you know that fu- you've been you've been doing it for a long time now. Is 26 there twenty six years? Twenty six. Yeah, wow, I'm, I'm so I'm, I'm I'm nineteen. I'm in nineteen years, so I'm really? starting my twentieth year. Okay. I started like you right out of college, but right. I'm I'm much older than I look. Yeah, uh, you look great. Seventy seven. Um, that uh, <laughs> I started right after the Vietnam War. <laughs> I, no, I, uh, <laughs> I I started right after college, and uh, now that I've been doing it more. Like almost half my life, I can tell you. Like, I'm glad I I never I never wake up and go like, damn, I wish I never did comedy. Right. I mean, it's like I love doing it. And did you go through a period where you felt that way though? Oh, the beginnings because I had day jobs. So what I would do is like, uh, you know, I lived in Brooklyn before it was cool to live in Brooklyn. And <laughs> when I would, it was uh, just poor people. <laughs> yeah, I would go into the go into the city, do my job, go home, change, and then go back out for the open mics. Get loaded, wasted, drunk, whatever. Mm-hmm. Then run back to Brooklyn, and then come back to work the next day, and like change in the whole, you know, the room and all that kind of stuff. Right, so right. it was, uh, it was a lot of years like that. You yeah, know? and uh, you know, I never really think about those years because those were the hard years of like bombing and like you know, like just not even knowing what a joke was. Like one of the best advice things anyone ever said to me was like tape your set. Yeah, and I tell it to every young comic that like comes up to me, and go like, what should I do? And I'm like. Well, do you listen to your set? And they'll be like, no. I'm like, well, you got to listen to it. And it's painful. You know, right? So fucking painful. I have so many recorded sets I've never listened to. You'll do everything else until that, like, you'll groom a dog. You'll clean (laughs) your ceiling. And then it's like, oh, that tape is waiting. (laughs) And then you'll listen to them. And I actually, when I was getting ready for a special, I had to listen to, like, 17 hours of old sets. And it was like, oh, the same joke told 15 different ways. Horrible. Every once in a while, like, there's a buried gem. You go, oh, there's a tag in there. I forgot. Yeah. But so. 17 hours I couldn't do I couldn't listen to them. I couldn't do it I could if I if there wasn't I would want to throw myself out of something a window <laughs> a car or something it was horrible um, yeah it's it's. I love that guys come to you for uh, advice because I feel I like no, <laughs> I know but I mean like I would love to I don't think I've done uh, if I ever saw well. you when I was I would be like oh my god there's David Tell I'm gonna ask him what I should do well you know the joke we always used to say was like well, what what do you do with the microphone? What hand do you use when you take it out? And they go like, "Well, my left hand." I go, "Well, I can't help you." you know, like it, it was like one of those like kind of gunfighter things. Right. But I think most of the comics, you know, the comedy community, like especially like in New York, uh, it's pretty much like once you kind of earn your bone and get into the club, there's really very little competition. There used to be like towns like that was super co- competitive, right. like, like Boston, Boston, wow, Boston like, right? Murder. I went up there and did a uh, headline set when I shouldn't have headlined. I wasn't even good enough to headline. And every dude up there gunned, the, can I curse on this? Yes, like a Gu- Rip me a new asshole, gun the shit out of me, oh. would say, do you mind if I can go ahead of you? And I was like, from New York, of course. Right, yeah, because it's co- it's collegial down there, no big deal, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Let this young professor, he probably has a class to teach in the morning. And they would just 
gun me with local references and voices. Right, and, just destroy you know, and the mayor blow the room and, up. you know, the Revere's and the, oh. all the towns. And then I would go up there with my shaky ass, you know, 46 minutes, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I died. And I deserved to die because I was in their town and they wanted to show who's boss. And right. I, much respect for the Boston scene back then. Yeah. So. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, everything I've ever heard of from everybody's come out of the town was that it was just, you know, like a snake pit. Just, yeah. Yeah. Sharks. It, it, it was, you know, best man, whatever, survivor, right, whatever yeah, it is. Best man winner, last man standing. Something like that. Um, it was a lot of dudes. It was, it was, it was a reason. sword fight in Boston, for it sure. It was. Yeah. <laughs> you're right about that one. Do, when you were... I'm still so curious because I just I think of you as being such an artful comic. I'm not. Kind of- I am not a artist or I'm a I'm a <laughs> I'm real I'm really not. I'm just tricky. I'm not even that good a comic, and I'm not saying that just because like oh this guy's so. Humble. No, it's like I look at my friends and how good they've gotten and how they found their voices and stuff like that. And for me, it was always about the joke. Like, what's right. the next joke? Go on stage, find the next joke. You know, don't waste the stage time because when I used to work the door at the Improv in New York, mm-hmm. I'd see the same guy come up. Same people come up every night doing the same act. Right. Then they get wasted, and then you know they all were high fiving, waiting for the call for a sitcom. Yeah, yeah, waiting for Letterman to stride it and anoint them. Yeah, yeah no, they all thought they were going to get sitcoms. And yeah. And I, I said, if I ever get to the point where I'm getting that much stage time, I'm going to try something new every time, or as much new shit as I can yeah. possibly do without yeah. totally destroying the gig. And sometimes I'll go up to and do half-ass bullshit sometimes i'll just like try the joke a different way right and it makes it interesting for me and it also i think is what you're supposed to do yeah on these kind of gigs that's what i think but well i think style. those guys also i mean you've you, you've also come across because you you've done so much road work mm-hmm. the guy who's stuck in the town because he's been doing the same hour his like for fucking 15 oh, years bobby bitterman yeah, yeah bobby bitterman <laughs> dead inside guitar guy yeah you know <laughs> where you're just like and they don't understand why nothing's changed i'm like because you haven't changed mm-hmm. but i but i guess i'm curious about that feeling of going up there and uh, d- is there a part of you that's maybe addicted to like the panic of is this going to work or not yeah no i i really do love the idea of being outgunned outnumbered i love the fact that the uh uh you know that it's not working sometimes and like or i'll say something totally inappropriate and then like try and win it back yeah it's kind of playing me you know it's jerking yourself off well it's like it's like tiger woods like hit into the sand see how many strokes it takes you to get it out that's true i wouldn't put myself on the level of tiger but i I think you get it if you could get that much pussy then that would be really great fucking awesome Mm, man i mean either way uh (laughs) that guy i mean the the good thing about comedy is that like if you get like the stage time which is really you know what makes a comic better? I think you were just talking about it earlier. It's yeah. True. It's like the stage time really does make the comic better. Nowadays, I think a lot of people do some stage time and then they have some kind of following through like Twitter or something. Right, like that. right. And they immediately like, you know, try and like go to the next thing. But back when I was starting, and I hate to be the old man, it's like you middled and then you headlined or you like did open mics, open mics, open mics, got some credits, and then you went out headlining, mm-hmm. and you still were unprepared. Right, and you're right. Like, what was all that about? You right. Know? Like, how could I not go over here in Kansas City? How yeah. could I not work? How did, how did it, why is it not working? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I remember when I was a baby comic, like, seeing guys headline, I remember seeing some guy headline up. You, you played Tommy T's in San Ramon. You ever played that yes, game? Yes, I did. I remember I going out the there. I stage, as I call it. <laughs> yes. Like a little stripper stage there. <laughs> a little tiny, like, mm-hmm. narrow, four-foot stage. And uh, a guy getting up there doing 20 minutes material and then pulling out a notebook. And I remember thinking, if I'm ever a headliner, I will never yeah. fucking do that. But, um, but you're right. That's so the many... wrong club to do that in. Oh, my God, yeah. That is the and he got club. what he deserved. Oh, yeah? He oh, learned. He learned okay. his lesson. Good. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, I, I think... You're, there is no substitute for time. It doesn't matter who, you, how funny you are, how talented you are. You have to just keep getting up. Well, there is that point where, I don't know if it happened for you, but where you cross over, where you realize that, like, you know, my life before this is now gone. Like, right. the, the me before comedy is now uh, almost a memory. The people that I, you know, talked to and hung out with, they are no longer as relevant to what I'm doing than now. And I'm not trying to be a dick about it. It's just that like, you finally found that group of people that kind of understand you Mm -hmm. that like go through the same stuff with you. And like, it's so much fun to hang out with them. And that's like when you lose like, you know, like your earlier life, you know, right. your friend from, you know, whatever, college or all that kind of stuff. And it does suck because when you look back on it, you're like, why didn't I hang out with those people more? You right, know? And right. And they all 
you know, had regular jobs and had families and all that kind of stuff. So it, well, you're it's a different. vampire, though. I mean, you're yeah, a, yeah. It's definitely there's definitely something to like the nightlife. To the once you get like into like the scene and the style and just like the feel of like, dude, look at all these suckers going to work, man. I'm <laughs> fucking wasted and I'm going home. You know, yeah. I just hope I can make rent this month. Um, I want to return to a question I asked you before, and then I want to talk about that more because um, you were saying that occasionally you throw out a joke that you know is going to derail the set, and then you try to bring it back. Uh, and you're obviously you're at a point in your life creatively where there's no doubt you're going to be able to get it back on track. But was there a time earlier on where you, I guess I remember vividly the times when my set would derail and I would p- panic. Like I'm like, I can't, I'm, this is it. This set is over. I'm done. Right. And then I remember kind of slowly doing it long enough to be like, okay, no matter what, I know I can get them back at some point. So do you remember that time? And you're like, I guess I'm like wondering about that transition when you started to realize that no matter what, you were going to be able to bring the audience back on your side. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I had a lot of sets where, like, I would call it a draw, if not a loss, where, like, <laughs> you know, like, I did my time, which was always the important thing back then. Like, just do your just time. Just do the time you do were paid time, to do. And then you realize, and, you know, this is like, you know, poor comics, but you realize you just burned through all your material in eight minutes, and now you have yeah. another whatever hour or whatever you have to do. And that's kind of also good too because then now you got to really start thinking on your feet yeah you know and uh, new york is known for its crowd work and all that kind of stuff so we all kind of like grew up in this whole like interactive you know in the moment kind of thing and that's what i like about comedy like when it's in the moment like when one show will never ever be like that again like never never be the guy wearing the funny hat and you know the girl who was you know a, a bachelor party actually right. there's always a bachelor party. but you know you know what I'm saying <laughs> yes, like the like, characters that make it all so special yeah, yeah. but I, I would say that yeah like when you lose the crowd you got your work cut out for you if this is about if this is about comedy I would say that you know a lot of comics go up there especially new comics who have like honed their set they think and the, they don't lock into the crowd or they don't yeah. read the crowd. Like, I, yeah. I look at the crowd, I'll always go, What's the crowd like? Yeah. And all these people are like, Does it matter? You're just going to do your set. And I'm like, Well, it matters to me because if I do a clan joke and there's a guy out there with a, you know, a hammerhead, you know, skinhead, I don't think he's going to like it unless it's a pro clan <laughs> joke. You know, so it's like sometimes these jokes might, you know, help the set. Sometimes they might save your life. Right. So that's right. what I gotta, you know. But yeah, protect you from a curve stomping. Or exactly. Like that too. Yeah. Um, Oh, I had something great to ask you, but it fell out of my head. And it was about, oh, it was about, like, the life of a comic. So you were talking about these people, like, the people that you had a relationship with before you became a comic and, and your life now. Yeah. Um, how do you feel? Do you have kids? No, I don't have any kids. I'm not married, so. Do, do you feel like that was a conscious choice, or was that just a side? I don't Look have kids either. Come I, on. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me, I'm ugly. No, uh, you're it's, not. It's not a conscious choice. I think that you, in comedy, like you, you, you really are pretty lucky because, like, um, I always used to think that, like, you know, I'm, I'm packed and I'm ready to go. Yeah. Which is a really, it's a loaded thing, meaning that, like, you know, I can leave town. Like, yeah. I can leave town for like three weeks, and you know, whatever. Like, whoever I was hanging with no longer has got a boyfriend, or right. like the people that I was hanging with, they they moved on, and like they, they're <laughs> on the road or something. So I always felt it was kind of cool that like you know every town's different. You move, you keep moving around, and for a while there, especially in your twenties, you know, I grew up on Long Island. You know, it was pretty boring. It yeah. was kind of cool to be in like you know the heartland and like being up in Alaska. Yeah. You know, like doing all these crazy shows all over the place. So I, I was into it, man. It was like my uh, my Hemingway kind of moment. You know, getting yeah. out there. Well, and you're like, and you know, you're like a renegade on the road. You got a tiny bag. You're just you're rolling. Yeah. yeah every, it was yeah. before the shoes off and you know terrorism. Yeah. So yeah. you know we were walking on the plane, just having a great time. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, 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 I regret the fact that I didn't put more energy into uh, developing a sound relationship or at least get a dog. <laughs> because all my friends who are married, they always have that to talk about. And I'm like, I'm always like, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, you always have that, you know, because that's yeah. the whole thing when you get, first it's finding out what a joke is and then it's finding topics for jokes. And I think right. every comic after 10 years plus is like, now what should I talk about? What what's going on? Wife, you know, kids, dog. Topical. Should I become political now? What should right, I do? You know? Right. And and uh, and and there is something both wonderfully and terribly repetitive about the life of a comic. I mean, I, I loved Insomniac I, because it was the first time when I felt like one of somebody in our tribe was talking about what it feels like to be in a place and not of a place and have kind of un- like this period, uh, this unlimited period of time to kind of do whatever the fuck you want. Because, you know, we work for an hour a day. 
Right. You know, and you're in a place where you, you know, you've kind of got like, you know, you've got a weekend, you've got four days, you have money, you don't have any responsibilities. True. And um, I mean, you know, you can use your powers for good or evil, and most of the time we use them for evil. Yeah, I, I think that the the cool thing about that show was, even though it wasn't designed as like a drinking party show, if anything, it was supposed to be about when I came up with the show it was about like. Finding the party in, in, you know, keep using Kansas City, which is actually a party town, mm-hmm. uh, at least back when we used to play it, is like finding a party in the offbeat towns, not the Miami, the South Beach. Right. You know, like right. the high end, like like we're an ugly dude like myself would party, <laughs> like, which was the majority of America, which was regular people partying on the weekend in Charlotte, Carolina. You know, right, kind of right. Stuff. So that's what that show was about. And it was also about people who worked late. And um, that show was really cool. It really did like draw a crowd for me yeah but it, it wasn't necessarily the best comedy crowd it was a tv crowd that was my first experience where like people see you on tv and they want you to be exactly like you yeah you are on tv yeah and before that i really was like basically focused on becoming a comic like a national headlining like a touring comedian to the wall fucking hard you know knife fight comic yeah and that you know brought in a whole other crowd and uh, you were know, were they soft? Do you feel like they were a bad. softer crowd? It was good and it was bad. I mean, like, there were great times, bad times. But you know, I did get to make some money at that point. Yeah. But at the end of the day, now that like that crowd is older, and like some of them still come to the show, but uh, all I can say is that like I'll perform to anybody as long as they don't bring in their politically correct bullshit, uh, snarky bullshit, and like are on their phones and taping and all kinds of stuff. Right. That's the only thing that bothers me now. Heckling. You know, that's like, I guess, universally part of comedy to right, some degree. Right, right. But back then, it really was like, uh, it was impressive to see how many people will come out to see you do a show when they have seen you on TV. But right. I never fell into this whole, like, bottle service, now I'm going to kick it with, you know, right. other celebrities, the uh, deadliest catch guys, and I, you know, <laughs> other reality stars. Yeah. No, I never I never consider myself, I'm a loner, you know, and yeah. I, like, I like my deal where I get to roll whenever I want. And uh, uh, all I'm going to say is that, I thought up the idea of the show. I'm glad people liked it, and I'm glad that we stopped doing it. I would. Are you glad that you stopped doing oh, it? Oh, absolutely. I, I I don't think I could have continued forward with it the way it was going. Not because the idea was stale, just because we were not getting access to like the things that I wanted to do, which was the late night stuff, the jobs, and all that kind of stuff. And also, people knew about the show, so they would come down and kind of like act out. You right, know, right. They so would act out, and I couldn't use it because you I couldn't get show. access to the kind of the underworld that you wanted because people knew who you were, and you were kind of a known yeah, quantity. And, it was supposed yeah, to be, I was supposed to be a fly on the wall kind of right. Guy. Come in the bar and drink it up, and you, you were know. kind of doing no reservations before Anthony Bourdain was, though. I feel like. Well, I think what he does is kind of like more important for society. <laughs> knowing where to get a steak in Haiti. <laughs> no, I mean all these shows have their problems, and I'm jealous of these shows only for one thing, like the travel aspect. Like we yeah. got to go on like four big trips. They go to like you know where are we going? It's like uh, Switzerland, and then we're gonna head to Thailand. And oh yeah, it's like n- no. I'm like where uh, we we you know had to save up. We had to like, kick money into a can to get to Germany. You know? <laughs> um, so we're gonna jump back, and then we're gonna jump forward. Sure. Uh, because I'm still so curious about your first... So you said your first set was with Adam Sandler. Was that... Did you go... That was my you- first set. That was uh, the first road gig, even though we both were at NYU. He's a year or two younger than me, so mm-hmm. I was just lucky that he asked me to do it. My first gig, I guess you could say, uh, was at Governor's on Long Island. That was the first like real stand-up club. And I bombed horribly. I, uh, you know, That was the club where like Kevin James and you know uh, a lot of the Long Island guys came out of. Uh, John Mulroney, who is really... I guess not known as much as he was back then. He was like the king of that club and a really funny guy and like really got the crowd going. And, you know, those guys would MC and they'd bring you up. And I just remember basically my myself, you know the feeling where you lo- leave your body yes. and watch yourself bomb and boo yourself? <laughs> like that's what was going on in those situations. And, you know, that really continued for a long, long time. I was not a performer. I was not... <laughs> a performer. I mean, I had a good sense of humor, I thought, but I was never a performer like, you know, hey, who's uh, in the school play this year? I tell. No, I was never that. Guy, so. <laughs> Do you ever have that? I might have already asked you this, but I'm so curious. Because uh, uh, I think Bill Burlight named like his 
two specials ago because he's made like 15 fucking specials. Fuck you, Bill. Bill is a great, He's great so comic. funny. Pure. He's, he's a pure comic. Pure. He's a pure comic, and he's incredibly prolific. Mm-hmm. And I, pr- pretty much every opportunity I have to tell him to go fuck himself, I do. Okay. So, because uh, he's made, literally he's made like seven comics in the last, seven specials in the last three years. But he named one of his specials, Why Do I Do This? And I remember thinking like h- how vividly I had had that thought. Like uh, in my like, you know, just at points in my career, like, why am I doing this to myself? Did you ever have that moment where you're like, I don't know, man? Because, uh, because you know, you said you you said you had all those years where you really struggled as an art, like as a comic, where you weren't funny and you you know and you were bombing kind of consistently. And did you ever have a point? where you were like, maybe I don't want to do this anymore? Because I feel like comics just in their bones, no matter whether they're killing or failing, know that they're comedians. Uh, and they know. can't stop. I didn't have that kind of self-esteem. So really? I, uh, <laughs> I'd say for the first seven years, I had a day job to some degree um, in one way or the other. And that it was always like, keep doing it. You know, Maybe this is the guy I'll be where I have a day job. And then you know, at night I'll do comedy and I'll be cool with that. And you know, uh, you know, that'll be my thing. And I guess there was part of me where, like, I wasn't successful at the day job, and I wasn't successful at comedy. And then once I, I think I got one credit doing something, maybe it was like A and E at the Improv or something. Mm-hmm. Then I was like, well, I guess I am a comic. I mean, like, there's right. no denying it now. I'm actually being recognized as a comic. Right. And as I went forward, like with Letterman, and then I was a writer on SNL. Yeah, I want to hear about SNL. Uh, you know, then I was like, I'm in this business, you know, regardless. But up until I was about 29 or 30, I was always like. What's the age limit on joining the Navy? Because I was like, that was my plan. I was going to do that in high school. I was going to do it after college. And I kept pushing it back to like the point where I was like, all right, well, I'm just a comic now. I'm yeah. drunk. You know, I'm drinking. <laughs> I'm hanging out. I'm having a great time. And I love doing comedy. So, you know, it took me a long time to accept that that was what my life was going to be, the comedy. So, What was your life like for the time you were at SNL? Did you... Was- Okay, go ahead. I was just going to say, did you love it? Did you hate it? No, I think for a lot of people, that's their dream. Like, a lot of the people that I started with that year, it was their dream to be on that show. That was, like, not even in my dream box to be on that show. I'm not putting the show down. I'm not saying I I was, you know, like, I really, like I said, I really had just figured out, like, about being a comic. And then all of a sudden, this came along. And I had, like, agents and managers at that point, to some degree, you know. I was friends with Jon Stewart. So, like, his people were kind of, like, half-managing me. So, yeah, yeah. Did you know him from stand-up? I knew him, yeah, from mm-hmm. the clubs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, as good as he is now, he was a great comic way before any of us were. He figured it out. He had known, you know, he he, he just really is uh, a naturally great guy to be hanging out with. Mm-hmm. But also, like, a really good comic. And, like, he really has a great sensibility, you know, of the situation, what's going on. And, like, you know, very topical and... Smart. Smart is definitely the word you can use. So Mm -hmm. either way, my dirty, filthy act uh, at that point, (laughs) I was like, now I feel like I know what I'm doing. And like, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to be Bill Hicks or I'm going to be one of these guys and I'm going to fucking die on the road. My parents going to have to pull me out of some (laughs) shitty morgue. So I'm like, you know, or they're going to bury me there. And like, you know, then like years later, you know, my niece or somebody will come dig me up. I had all these great like dark fantasies about dying on the road. And then... um, then the SNL thing came along, and they're like, we want you to be a writer, assistant. They have, like, all these titles over there. So it's like, we want you to be, like, a writer, assistant, uh, kind of cast member, but you'll never get on camera. <laughs> and I'd never written a sketch. I've only written for myself. And then they threw me in that situation. And it was a bad situation, like, to begin with. But I'm glad I had the experience, because what I learned at SNL is probably something you learned being living in L.A., which is that show business has, like, a way about itself. Like, show business... Show business pr- promote, promotes show business. Mm-hmm. That's what it really promotes. Mm-hmm. It's never anything else. Like after the show, and we would do some horrible, horrible shows on <laughs> SNL. I, I couldn't even get a sketch on. So when you don't get a sketch on, your job is to sit there and just like be someone that no one makes eye contact with. Like, oh, this guy's a loser. This guy's a loser. Don't even look at him. You'll get his stink on you about not getting a sketch on. So me and the other people who didn't do it, we would sit there, watch the show, mingle around. I left the show sometimes to go do stand-up because I was like, fuck it. I'm not going to hang out here and just be like on the bench all the time. Right. So anyway, 
Uh, the thing, but then they would have these elaborate parties at SNL, like where they would like take over an entire like restaurant, and all the writers would sit in one area with their girlfriends, and then uh, the cast members would be all milling around to be like this, you know, like all these chicks that wanted to meet them, and then there would be uh, the host of the week would be sitting with Lauren and the head writer, and you know they would be like at the table, like uh, on the top of the mountain, with like, like a spotlight. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, that's show business. That's what it is. It's like yeah. everybody has to know their place, like a cast system. Like mm-hmm. in India or something like that, and then there'd be me, like the guy, like really drinking. You know, the rest of them like were like Harvard drinkers. You know, <laughs> I'd be like really drinking, looking for blow or something like that. I'm like, what happened? I thought this was like the funnest show in the world. What what the fuck's going on here? And then you know, it was like that for a whole year. And right. Sometimes you would get a joke on you'd be like, yeah, I did it. And then sometimes you'd be like, wow, this is just a horrible mistake. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I can't wait to get out of here. Was it as competitive and kind of cutthroat as yeah, some of the absolutely. people? Yeah, but you you know what to be uh, to be fair there's a lot of really talented people at SNL and uh you know a lot of them had like i said dreamt of being on that show uh wrote at Harvard and did all that kind of stuff so i give it to them you know right it was just the wrong scene for me right um and then how long ago after that was it before or after that you were at the daily show um i would say it was Probably afterwards, I did like uh, some of the corresponding thing, mm-hmm. and that was really just I think John throwing me a bone because he was really just like, you know, you go up there and like we'll get like a bunch of your jokes, like because I was like a big joke writer, you yeah. Know? So I'd write like a bunch of jokes, like, and then we'd find a topic, and then we would do like this kind of back and forth, me and John going back and forth, and uh, that was a lot of fun. But I always felt like once again, it was like not my scene. It was like more I could tell like what he was going to do with the show. He wanted to make it really what what it is now which is a powerhouse of like you know great great uh sarcastic views of the news you mm-hmm. know a parody of like the real news and i didn't see myself as a part of that lewis black i thought made that show he really was so funny and you know when i got to tour with him um he was the first guy i i met in comedy who like uh, told me like you know hey you know you know it's really all about like uh you know, sticking to what you believe in, mm-hmm. and like you know, he was the first political comic I ever met. You mm-hmm. know, so he's a big influence on me too. Did you? Do you feel looking back now? Because I feel like I'm hearing a trend, uh, and not in a negative way. A failure. Uh, so far, no, no. Up is a fail. I don't, no. I don't mind that because I revel in failure. So right? <laughs> Good. Well, as long as you feel at home. Mm. It was something about you not being a joiner. About you. About you. Because I think that there are some comics who who like kind of a group setting and there's some guys who just are loners, you know, who just thrive best when they're writing for themselves or performing for themselves, that there's something about isolation that, that they enjoy. Uh, yes. And I mean, like, I'm a loner in terms of my life, I guess, but um, <laughs> I loved hanging out with the other comics. When we first started, we would all like go, you know, like you see in the movies, yeah, oh, yeah. we'd all get something to eat and, you know, yell, I mean, topping and all that kind just, of and just making fun of each talk other. Shit of each, I mean, the best yeah. part of being a comic is sitting down with 10 people and just talking shit. Yeah, that's, that's always like the fun of it. But yeah. I would say that, yeah, I, I was not a joiner. In turn, well, I didn't have the skill set that would like. I was never an actor. Mm-hmm. Like in my family, the most talented person is my sister. She's a musician, like you know, actress person. Mm-hmm. She's really great. And mm-hmm. I was just like the guy who blundered into this stand-up world, and it kind of fit me. And you know, when uh, when you say like, you know, like uh, I'm sure you've run into this because like you've done like some acting, you mm-hmm. know, yeah. where it's like you know you run into these actors and they go like. I'm thinking of trying stand-up. It might help me with my acting, uh, auditioning. And I'm like, well, you know what? If you go into it with that mindset, you're going to do it twice. And then you're going to be like, why are all these people hanging around in this horrible situation on a Tuesday night at <laughs> 1 in the morning? What, don't they have to get up and go to the gym and do you know, whatever voice things? <laughs> and you'll be like, no, this is it. This is real comedy. It's not what you see on TV. This is, the, this is being a comic right now. Yeah. Waiting to go on somewhere or working a shitty club somewhere yeah. or your flight's canceled and now you're not going to be able to make rent. And the club owner blames you. Like yeah. you run the airline, or doing radio at six in the morning after you've been, you know, blasted all night, and like, you know, trying to get through it. Those were the early days of comedy, and that's what being a comic is. But when these people come into it, going like, oh, you know, that would be a great thing for me to like show another side of me. I'm always like, I don't know if we want to see that side. No, no, you know? we don't. And also, and also, you know, it's it, uh, uh, the, when people say that to me, it's like, I, I think you're. All in or you're not because it's like there's yes. the first set and That's then there's good. the thousandth set. There's no fucking around. Like either you're, you're going to try it the one time and either it's for you or it's not. But 
it's not like you do it 10 times and you learn something. You learn that you don't have a stomach for it. I mean, I don't know. I feel like you're either all in or you're not all in. I, I think that's the best way to put it. It's like you got to go all in on it and then like let the cards you know fall where they may. And now that I'm like 47 years old, and I don't mind giving my uh, age away because you know I'm not going to be in any of the Twilight Saga. You know, <laughs> I'll never be on any of the teams. But <laughs> me I, and you both, my friend. I, well, I don't know. You because you're, you're, you, you you're old. Uh, me because I'm black. So all yes. right, <laughs> we haven't even gotten into that. Aspect. No, we'll get there eventually. No, but the uh, the point of it is that uh, you know when you're all in on it and you realize that like this is my role. And that um, I'm either going to make the best of it and, like, do the best I can. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who want to be famous. Mm -hmm. And, like, I never wanted to be famous. I wanted to be, like, this unknown, crazy fucking, like, you know, comic. I wanted to be this guy. And fame became a later thing once once people, you know, become famous. And also, um, uh, you know, we live in a world of fame. So, Mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. you know, you'll be the guy, the comic that night. And then some guy will come up to you and go, like, dude, I love your CD. And his girlfriend will be like, who is this guy? Why are you wasting my time? And then, you know, you'll be like, you know, it's like, I don't care about her. And I, I'm cool that this guy likes my thing. But you realize that, like, fame is its own thing. Yeah. And that uh, I'm glad that I was never, because I know a lot of guys who are decent comics, but never became famous and hate themselves. They're bitter. Right. They, um, and I'm like, if you really look back at it, dude, for the last 15 years, you haven't had a real job. Yeah. And you should always... Think about that, how much, like, you could be a bitter lawyer right now. You could right. be a bitter guy running a, a car dealership. Right. But you're a guy who gets to, like, come into a club, say what he wants to say, and leave. You yeah, know? And exactly. That's cool. We're, and work an hour a day. Yeah. Well, you talked about the fact that you felt like it was somewhat of a trap because once people saw you on Insomnia or whatever they saw you on, they mm-hmm. had they expected a very specific experience from you. And I don't know if I asked you this question, but did you ever feel like you had to deliver TV David Tell? During yeah. that, during well, the insomnia drank, period so of time, it wasn't that hard to. You know, it wasn't like I was, you know, like a. Are airwolf. you sober now? Yeah, no, I haven't drank in years, but mm-hmm. no. But back then, I would go shot for shot with these people because a lot of them, you know, like I, I grew up in the bar code, like you know, the bar world, and like uh, you know, I love bars and like you know, so hanging out in bars, I... and that was the thing. Like, like when I watched the Jersey Shore show, you know, which is like kind of like you know, like a group of people hanging out and drinking in bars, basically, and getting into mischief and all that. I'm like. Well, now with, you know, Twitter and all that kind of stuff, like, it's impossible to have, like, the same kind of bar experience. So no. I'm kind of glad I'm not in that in that world anymore. Yeah. But, yeah, I would go shot for shot. We'd do shots on stage. And, like, right. Stan Ope's another guy where, like, some guy, you know, you'd be right in the middle of a bit. And then some guy would, like, sneak up past the security, put two shots of Jaeger. And yeah. then you'd have to drink them. And then another guy would bring two shots of Patron, and then you'd have to drink them. And the next thing you know, you're shitting blood. That's what you're going to make. No, but yeah, it was, it, was a fun, it was a fun ride with the drinking. I would say this, though, for uh, the comics uh, of today, that there is n- no pressure at all to do any of that craziness. It's just pure self-destruction. So I would say em- embrace it. Live right. it up, dude. Right. You know? and, when, and, and everybody needs that period of... You know, I mean, I think there's something. Uh, sorry to get super heady, but I do feel like there's something about art, about being an artist, about making art on some level that you need to break things. You need to, you know, you have to live. You can't can't just like kind of get up every day and have like a bowl of yogurt and like read the paper and then get on stage and do anything transcendent or interesting. You, yeah, you got to break something <laughs> at some point. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I don't. I'm sure there's some guys that are just like maybe naturally so talented that like no matter what they can get up and be great. But I feel like you've got to suffer and you got to break shit and you gotta yeah. be a little fucked up i wish you were my manager no, no. <laughs> no but, but I, I think there's a lot of guys living out there romantic kind of viking funeral of like you know i'm gonna burn out and i'm gonna right. be morrison but i never was i like, it was like i really enjoyed like the bar life so i mean i was a, from long island you know i was raised drinking basically mm-hmm. and uh it wasn't like it was like i was putting on airs i i love to drink and mm-hmm. uh you know I, I did my job i was a functional drunk and all that but i would say that when you say art and like you know I know you said you don't think of yourself Yeah, I don't think of myself, but it, 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 I, I believe it, it is an art form. Well, mm-hmm. The way I do it is not arty <laughs> at all. It really is not. I mean, like, I know all the tricks, and, I, you know, I, well, I'm going for a different thing. You guys are <laughs> artists, but uh, all I can say is that there's, uh, uh, there, it's unfair to the guys who don't party and whatever to not, not include them in their own because for every guy who gets up and goes to the gym and eats the yogurt, he has a million other psychological problems, which I'm right, sure you've right. had to sit next to and hear over and over, some yeah. mother issue or some kind of commitment thing. And, you know, I don't know who's in worse shape, the drunk or the guy who has the OCD. Right, right. to keep touching his keys. You know? <laughs> or it's the end it's of his nose. Horrible. Or, so. Yeah. Um, 
And did you have a moment, uh, the mo- where was the, when, you probably told the story, right? But what was the moment that you decided to get sober? Oh, no, I just, I was done with it. I, my health was in bad shape. And it was really more about like, uh, you know, I was in my 40s and I, and I just like, you know, I want to move forward my, with my life. And I, and I did become a better comic uh, after, I, I mean, like I was more focused and angry because I didn't go to any program or anything like that. Yeah. I was very focused and angry on my act. And then the audience has changed. And then I became like a whole different kind of like, you know, like everybody's on their machines and they're doing right. this thing. And uh, I also got to the point where I was like, how much more of this do I want to do? Like, I want to keep doing this until I don't want to do it. Right. And I don't want a club to go like, you know what? Um, you know, we can't have you back yeah. here. And yeah, last like, time you, know, you were here, you yeah, know, the you numbers urinated just, in the carpet. Oh, no, not that. Not I mean, that. like, oh, the, the numbers. numbers. Yeah, the, the numbers are yeah. low. And, like, you know, we did all, you know, they won't have you on the radio. They won't right. do any kind of stuff. Right. So I don't want to just drag it out. I want to, like, do it to do it. And I want to do it as, because I, I really have given comedy my all. I really right. feel like I've given it my all, which is the saddest thing ever. Though. This <laughs> no. Is, this is what it is. No. But I would say for that when I, when I, kind of grew up because like my dad died and you know uh my dad died before the insomniac show came out mm-hmm. so he got to see me on snl but he never really got to see me like kind of do my own role and all that on the on the insomniac thing and you know i had to step up responsibly like my mom you know the, like we lost our house and i had to get my mom a house and i had to step up and kind of be very responsible and you know i realized that like i i am going to do this with comedy which is probably the most irresponsible no. career you can have. Like, you, you really can't count on, like, money coming no, in, you know? No. So, you know, I bought a house and all that kind of stuff. So, like, I realized that, like, the drinking is not going to be part of that. And right. that, you know, I was trying to be an adult. So, right. But it's boring. If you're listening to this out there and, like, don't drink, don't quit drinking unless you absolutely have to. Honestly, <laughs> it is boring. Life life is too long without those, you know. I I I stopped drinking this year. You uh, did? Yeah, and I don't know that I'm I didn't get sober. I just stopped drinking. You know what I mean? Like you I You seem like a very together person. Uh, well, well, I'm OC I'm the OCD one. I'm the anal crazy like obsessive compulsive. Mm-hmm. I, I always tell people if you've never seen a unicorn, the next most rare thing is a black person with OCD and I am that person. Wow. And uh and so super kind of type A, super like obsessive work obsessive you know is that self-diagnosed or people have told you you self-diagnosed i'm sure i mean if if i if i buy them somebody into my home and they saw all the right angles and the fact that i like dust bust out the bottom of my refrigerator and uh yeah like can't have anything on the car i mean like you know it's 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 all that clean right yeah yeah, hi it's a high functioning ocd i'm not debilitated by it but it's there you know it's there it's definitely i have like a set of obsessive behaviors but but I'm interested in that because it, I just stopped, and I I was I love booze. I t- like the first ten minutes of my act is about how much I love alcohol, like how I love to drink, how I uh, like had like a very elaborate bar set up in my house, and I have like special glasses that I drink out of, and I oh, have, wow. I'm like obsessed with you know I walk into yeah I walk into a bar, and if they didn't have certain things behind the bar, I wouldn't drink there. I'd have to go somewhere else. I mean, um, then you weren't a drunk. No, I wasn't a drunk. I was a drinker. I was like a, I a, stuck a, on the bar. Rack. A, <laughs> I, 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 I was like an aggressive stuff. recreational drinker. Okay. Um, but you know, that, like you said, there were things that I wanted to do that I realized that booze was kind of in the way of. Yeah, you know, I also lost a lot of friends to uh, drugs and alcohol. Yeah, like Mitch Hedberg. He, uh, you know, of course, there's a lot of powder involved there. But uh, yeah. you know, uh, and then Greg, I, I partied Toronto. with him, and then Greg Fitz. Uh, I'm sorry, Greg Fitz. Uh, him he's too. been sober longer than anybody. You know? <laughs> Greg uh, Geraldo, who was a good friend of mine. Yeah, and we used to drink together, and like you know. We always used to say, like, uh, well, I don't trust a guy who doesn't drink. And, like, it's kind of true. Like, you know, even now at this point, it's like, I don't trust myself not drinking. You know, like, I, you know, some of the stupid ideas I have. But, yeah, we had we had great times doing it. And, and, like, I think a lot of people romanticize the lifestyle and feel that, that, that you can indulge in these in these things. And all I'm going to say is, like, you know, is you could be a drunk truck driver, you could be a drunk whatever, and then yeah. like, you know, like just because we're comics, we just have more time to do it. We, yeah, know? we just have more time to and do less it. less responsibility. A softer landing. Yeah, yeah, it's softer landing. I mean, if yeah. you go out, you do your shows, you can drink until the sun comes up and you don't have to be anywhere the next day. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so. it's just that nice soft landing, right? But you still got to get, I mean, I wonder about like on stage, you were saying you became more focused and angry because I, I, I almost never drink before I go up. I never, I never Because I fucking before. forget my tags. I mean, that was the thing. I just didn't want to have a bad set. I was like, you 
you know, you got new jokes you want to try out, or like it just takes the your, the edge off your razor. Oh, you know, I love going on stage. I never uh, there were some guys I was like, I have to have my shot, and then they'd run up there and do their set. It's like I loved going on stage. It was the afterwards part that I found so depressingly boring and lonely right. and all that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of drinking on towards the end of the act where we do shots and all that kind right. of stuff. Right, but you know, uh, I don't think that that's that's like you know just kind of. You know, who cares at this point? Now it's really about, like, there's so many other self-destructive things that people do. Yeah. That, like, uh, you know, like, I smoke cigarettes, if you want to get personal. I was like, you know, the cigarettes are going to kill me before the booze ever would have. And, like, you know, but, like, being on the road without cigarettes is, like, almost like, I can't even fathom it. You know I mean? It's, like, it's, like, way too much downtime. Like, I spent hours standing around waiting to do radio, waiting to get on a plane, like, you know, all these different things. I, I don't think gum is going to fill that void. <laughs> what do you think? You know? Uh, as, I say, as I say, you, you can only masturbate so many times. Yeah, well, that's another thing. And you thing. can't like, do it in the airport, for sure. Which is a great tie into the porn show. Yes, but, uh, let's talk about the porn show. Yeah, let's first talk about why you can't do it. Now, <laughs> I wanted you to do the show. Because we've had some of the most amazing ladies I know in comedy on it. Uh, this season, Amy Schumer and Kathy Griffin. Yeah. Lisa Lisa Lampanelli. And we had Chelsea Handler, Whitney Cummings, uh, uh, Who's Margaret got Cho. a perfect last name for it. Yes, exactly. Yes. Everybody's porn connected there. And it's great to have them roll with it. Now, you are doing like some morning TV I show. have a daytime TV yeah, show. Yeah, you have a daytime TV Okay, so now yeah, I totally understand. it didn't seem like a fit. But I asked a lot of people to I but I, lot, if I wasn't on that, I mean, I, I love I totally my daytime understand. show, but it was really, that was it. I yeah. totally understand. Because I think it's a great fucking idea. And no, I talk about porn all it. the time. Yeah. But uh, just my head next to a penis was, was just <laughs> a little yeah. off piste for her. But that's the whole thing. It's like, uh, you know, it's cool to get not only uh, a funny person's perspective on it, but a woman's perspective. To, it's a to hilarious see. show. So, so that's really, like, I have tons of male old porn stars, and I need funny women to kind yeah. of, you know. yeah. Deball them basically, you know, because <laughs> because the, the whole point of the show is it's vintage porn. It's like yes. this kind of great old, it's like old. yeah, like it's vi- old. just sepia toned, right? Just like de- daguerreotype. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is very Zabruder filmy, kind of crazy <laughs> weird. Where do you where are you find? Is it, it these are all your own personal possessions? You guys um, are digging this stuff up for the no, show. No, it started with like the ones that I knew, and then like uh, of course you know. I used to do the VHS porn, like, top loader shit since yeah. it, like, came around. And as a comic on the road, like, I love porn and, uh, you know, living in New York City, which used to be the porn capital of the world. Now it's like the, you know, it's, iPhone sprint. It's, yeah, but no, it's here. It's, uh, I mean, yeah, I, feel, yeah, it's, I uh, mean, but, like, yeah. buying porn. Oh, like, buying you know, porn. Could, oh, yeah. I didn't even know where porn was made back in the day. I was like, I thought it, like, it was dropped from heaven. I was so <laughs> excited. Angels it, bring it. <laughs> yeah, like, I would come, like, when I thought they would have new tapes, but I was always too afraid to ask the guy, like, when are you going to have new tapes? And, right, like, right. You know, it would be, like, really exciting <laughs> when they had new tapes of these <laughs> shitty, disgusting New York peep show places. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the thing about it is we bring out the comic, we watch these old clips, we rag on them like Mystery Science Theater, yeah. and then we bring out the, the legend to tribute it, but we also do young porn stars watching old porn, which is very cool, because a lot of these young ones, especially this season, Asa, Kira, Jesse Jane, Jaden... Uh, uh, Jesse Jane, uh, Caden Cross, uh, Sean Michaels, who's a, a legend, a man of color, by the way. Very exciting. Exactly. Very exciting. I call him the Denzel Washington of porn. Well, there you go. He's about my age, but he's ageless. He also, like you wouldn't know. And uh, he has one of Unless my Unless you look very closely at his balls and then super old. And I have. <laughs> and he packs a lot of meat, so everything is, yes. <laughs> very exciting. It's all good. And uh, it's cool to meet these people. They're all so cool. And like hearing their take on it is so great. And we also brought in Adrian Curry, who's... Oh, yeah. One of the hottest, coolest chicks ever. Yeah. And uh, Andy Dick, to balance yeah, it out. absolutely. So that's a show at the end of the season. The one coming up this... I don't know when this is there. It will probably go up next week. Next week. Okay, so by then, that'll be Thanksgiving. So mm-hmm. we're going to do it right with a holiday classic, Debbie Does Dallas. Oh, that is, that now, is a classic. Now, you must have seen that one. You've seen porn. Everybody's seen that one. Okay, well, yeah, I have seen quite a bit of porn. You know, I don't, I'm not a connoisseur. Uh, and well, what be, kind of porn do you like? Well, so, what do I straight like? Up, like... Guy and girl, like your show. Yeah, or? I will, I'll almost look at anything. There are a couple of things that I find relatively disturbing when it gets to like be like gapey. I can't do like you any like kind of gaping okay. related stuff. Is That's kind okay. of gross. You're not me. alone with that. Uh, but you know, so here's the, here's what's interesting. I um, I don't think I was a big consumer of porn in the traditionalist days. I, uh, you know, you. My husband and I have looked at some stuff together. You but know. was it his idea or your idea? But he, uh, it depended on the, d- the day. Sometimes it was okay. his, sometimes it was mine. Okay. You know, usually if you're looking at porn with, and you're with someone you can have sex with, it doesn't. you don't watch it for very long. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but n- well, I often stumble into it uh, like accidentally now because like I'll be looking at like Gawker. 
And then there'll be a story about like uh, naked, uh, you know, uh, C- Congressman porn. Wiener. Okay. And then all of a sudden I'm on Fleshbot. And then once you're on there, I mean, it's like the YouTube of porn. You just like fall into the rabbit hole. And then yeah. you're looking at a guy having sex with his roommate with his socks on. The sun goes um, down. The sun and, comes yeah, up. Yeah, sun comes yeah. up. Your eyes are bleeding. The, and that's <laughs> always the fear that I have about porn and uh, is, is that I will look at too much of it. Oh. And then it won't be effective anymore. You know what I mean? See, that's very adult of you. you All know, right? I just feel, I can't, like at some point I'm like, ugh, I'm not feeling anything Yeah, I'm pretty I numb this. to it at this point. Right? You know, this like, is like, oh, let's put the thing in the hole. All the people who work on my uh, show, a lot of women, and mm-hmm. like, we basically, you know, have to watch endless amounts of retro porn looking to for- like find a good like the clips yeah. right yeah and also finding the scenes of the people that we want to attribute to right so, right right and everybody has a million different pseudonyms and like you know there's been looped and the movies are all like very who know you know who knows what the movie is so I have really good people that do it but we like I, I immediately go like okay so let's look for like a you know a good doggy shot and like we'll be looking and then I'll be like all right just fast forward. Right, right. I like can't even do it. So none I don't of us feel anything. It, right, you know? no. It's, it's, like, like, it's work. So, but it's like now. You trying know. to cure your kid of smoking cigarettes and giving him 100 cigarettes. Yeah. Right? It's like, you know, you, it's all the fun has gone out of it. But so, I feel like my brain now has been hardwired to uh, retro old porn now. So, like, when I watch new porn, I'm like, what is wrong with this? Right, you don't know what shaved. it is. <laughs> right, what and is going the lights on are too hot. Yeah. There's too much detail. Tattoos. What is that? Do you. Oh, this is an intimate question. Do you, is is there anything that you would find exciting anymore? Because that's the other thing. Like once you see, like I feel like if you see like and hugging, yeah. that's, what Kathy, <laughs> that's what Kathy said. On our show. I just like kissing and hugging. And uh, yeah, no, no, I don't know. I mean, like I think the more first of all, as a guy, when you get to meet these legendary women, especially mm-hmm. you know, and the guys are cool too. But mm-hmm. like you know, meeting Chrissy Canyon and Ginger Lynn after growing up, mad like rubbing like endless amount, gallons out to these women <laughs> is kind of a it, it is kind of a cool thing. And like. Like, you know, Christy's super hot still, and so is Ginger, and, like, you know, uh, it, it's fun. But yeah, they, no, seem, they seem happy, or do they seem like sad clowns? Uh, you know, everybody always puts this whole sadness on there, uh, but, you know, I, I think I could find 50 real estate brokers to porn star that are sad. On the sad, or, the sadness or, quotient. You know, yeah. whatever, have yeah. done, like, you know, disgusting hot tub fucking close the deal <laughs> moments. Right. But either way, uh, I, I think that there's a lot of preconceived, like, you know, they were touched or something. They're like, I really don't care. It's not that kind of show. <laughs> for me, it's a party show. Right, it's yes, a tribute show. Gonna, it's not an in-depth, like, Charlie You're not going to stop it all down and be like, so tell me what happened when you were a child. Yeah, no, I, I yeah. mean, like, I feel like that's their personal business. And yeah. as a comic, which I think we're all kind of broken toys. Right. It's like, you know... Evidently, something's not right with me that I do this. So I assume with you, <laughs> so you have your own. Stipulate problems. to that so and I'm move just on. Kind of like respectful of their lives. It's not right. like you know we're we're callous or whatever. It's like I'm here to bring them out, have a good time, do a couple dick jokes, and like show some of this great stuff. And yeah, yeah, I think they enjoy it because they never got the tribute that they no, deserve. They and like no it wasn't at all. Now, like with Sasha Gray, Jenna Jameson, the right. crossover acts that like became like really cool and hip to like you know, hey, I know a porn star. We have a porn star in this like an entourage or something. Right, like that. right. That like you know, a lot of these people like just kind of used up and thrown away. Yeah, so I, I don't like that. You know, no, as a comic, I'm... you know, I kind of feel like we're all in the same club of like you know, we're out there putting it out. We're all alone, and at the end of the day, you know, we're just going to be some kind of like skid mark on the street of success or whatever. Yeah. So I want to give them their moment, and I uh, I feel like I hope the show does that in the porn community which I've hosted the ABN many a time a lot of people come up to me and they go thank you for doing what you do like yeah. I'm some returning soldier or something I'm like <laughs> I'm not, what, thank you thank, thank you, you for, for your, doing what you for do for your service yeah right? exactly thank you for the excellent films that have you know thank you for the double penetration yes See, by the way the you can't well you can't look but I've seen it enough times where you I'm know like all ah, the terms. now that's just another deep, it's just another deep but I don't I, I would say that you know we could talk about a neutral topic which would be toys now, yes I think, I think women finally finally have embraced the fact that like they can have a toy or toys yes and yes. it's cool and uh as a dude i am totally cool with that well, i think that's great there's a lot of guys who don't even want the women to have vibrate what, what is this pakistan <laughs> i mean let the woman enjoy herself <laughs> right, exactly you're For not goodness. gonna do it anyway yeah exactly let, let her she knows her body and this yeah. is a thing made to help that you know. yeah it's just like it's like having a spotter you know it, I mean? it yeah, is. it, it really is. Like, is. Well, how would you, what, what, I what call it the help? stunt dick. I mean, that's what I say. It's like, you know, hey. I'm going to tap out for the hero dick. There you and go. I'll be and I'll be the one taking them out to eat. So <laughs> it's a win-win. Um, and I la- so have you ever had any of these porn uh, stars come in and look at and like be touched by the, like when you do that kind of the homage piece? That's a great question. Uh, a lot of them, since they've made thousands of movies beyond 
anybody, it's so hard to even get an exact number on how many movies they made. They look at the movie, they look at themselves fucking, and they'll be like, wow. And you can tell, I'm like looking at them, look at that, and I'm like, I wonder if they're hard or if they're sad or if they're whatever. Wistful, Wistful or you know, proud. What other yeah. emotions are going to be? They only have sleepy. those four. To sleep. yeah. <laughs> whatever. They, they, uh, and I think a lot of them have a flashback to this time because the one thing I will say about porn stars, which comics wish they were, is like they're always in the moment. Like they'll, they'll like do like, you know, whatever. Hey, girlfriend. And they'll like go down on each other yeah. and like start eating each other's boxes and all this stuff. <laughs> and like, uh, you know, there's very little like, you know, like, you know, forward thinking it's right. like this is now this is happening I'm a, I'm a sexual person and i really express myself through that and th- they're into it and i think when they watch themselves especially if they're older and they watch themselves back then and it's like they're like i think i can always hear it in their head like man i am i was really fucking hot yeah like, I yeah was like, i was like the shit you know? yeah and now the older ones they still have like this amazing metapausal sexuality to them. right right you know, they're probably more sexual of, now than they were before probably yeah. you know i think you're right i think you're right about that That's yeah a good point how interesting and i like you said they probably don't get their props at all because i would imagine that in general except for a couple of big famous stars mostly men mm-hmm. porn like many other things is a young person's game so you know especially mm-hmm. for the women right you mm-hmm. do well in your 20s and 30s and then you know they're the kids coming up i mean it's like anything i would imagine True. But there's a lot of kinks now, the MILF and the, you know, right, right. The daddy porn and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we could talk about it all day long, but I was just wondering, like, since you, like, you've done modeling, right? No, I look like one, but I... I okay, is that was, insulting? I no, 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 it's not an insult. It's very flattering. I, okay, I have my not... next question was porn. Did anybody ever approach <laughs> you to do porn? Uh, you know, no. Uh, okay. but, but I was very bookish and nerdy. Very. That's uh, a kink, too. That's I could I could have done some, like, <laughs> kind of, like, Harry Potter-esque stuff and, you know, was, like, hell bent on college and all that shit since then i often have fans tweet and ask like are you gonna do playboy and i'm gonna say something awful that you're gonna it's gonna offend you and all the probably people not at all i feel like and i have post news new twice both for both for women's magazines uh you know in that kind of sure. like hollywood way where you're kind of covered up i did it both right. uh one for uh glamour on the a cock tease yeah ab- absolutely right. i'm absolutely teasing every way uh and um but i would never do playboy i can't think of any circumstance under which i would do playboy or porn wow and it's super judgmental saying it out loud i feel like um well for- playboy is a numbers game like they usually throw a lot of money at you or or you but you like, have to be could- in need you know what i mean you have to essentially be in need yeah. you have to say i need the money or it's like to reinvigorate. Your reinvigorate, career, yeah, exactly. Career. I mean, the people who have done it, I I fully respect it. I'm not. I'm, it sounds more judgmental than it is. It's just not for me because I feel like as a comic, mm-hmm. that would essentially like break my break my shield. Right. Do you know what I, I mean? It. Yeah. Um, but now you didn't ask me if I would do it. So now I would you do porn, really, Dave? Um, in the that world is of- all about you leading me back to asking <laughs> you whether you would do no, porn. No, no, no. It's <laughs> like, have you I would porn? never do porn because, first of all, I have a small dick. But also... <laughs> but you know what? There's a, there's a fetish there's for that a fetish as well. For that too. Absolutely. That's right. Whale on a Tic Tac. Absolutely. No, no. I, I, I never like was like the guy like, I wish I could be in there. Like I'm into just the situation, basically. And I think most guys, once they watch enough porn, it's situational. Like, you know, it's like, that's the cool thing about the retro porn. Like it's dramatic, right? Cheesy, yeah. A lot of yelling and screaming at each other, you know. A lot of like fake soap opera moments, you know. <laughs> and like today's porn, it's really basically like P ninety X gym bang, you know, right. pile driving. But I was going to ask you this because, like, you know, a lot of these girls. Like uh, now in these magazines, they'll show like the old hairy porn as like a kind of like back in the day. Right. And they'll show today's porn. And I have to tell you that, you know, maybe it's from watching all the retro, but the girls back in the 70s and 80s, there's a sexuality to them that there isn't today with today's girls. And I think Mm. a lot of it has to do with, you know, back then these girls were either partying or they were in like some kind of like wild moment. Maybe more self-selecting too. I feel like there were fewer people doing it and Uh the people that were doing it wanted to be there. And Maybe. maybe there's so many more people doing it now that like, I don't know. It's just like, you know, there's just like millions and millions of videos being generated. And so kind of the quality Mm -hmm. of it has gone down and, People can get it so easily and for free. It doesn't feel special sure. anymore. So it's just like, get to the good part now. You right. Know? Yeah. You're right. I, I just think that, like, when you brought up Playboy, it's like that, I, as a guy who reads Spank Mags, like, mm-hmm. that's pretty low on my tone pole. I'm not putting Playboy <laughs> down, but I'm putting Hustler up. Right, <laughs> Hustle, I like it a lot better. and uh, you know I like it all the way through from conspiracy Jokes, theory, theory 
to, uh, you know, a dick of the month to, uh, you still know. still doing beaver hunt? Uh, yeah, exactly. And the girls that are in that, like, we use that as their credits because, like, that is big in the porn world. Like, right. for every girl in those magazines, there's, like, another 50 who tried to get in Right, and, right, like, right. It really is, like, you know, we can poo-poo these magazines, but it really is, like, good a good sounding board of, like, who's hot, who's working, right. you know, where they are in the business. And uh, I would just say that, like, I think every woman wants every woman wants to watch the porn that they want to watch with mm-hmm. their guy, but mm-hmm. he wants to watch it, you know, basically alone, dirtier. dirtier. No, dirtier. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know? dirtier. Yeah, but I don't course. know. I think today's guys are pretty metro, so maybe they don't. Maybe guys find uh, some porn. Guys have turned me down from being on the porn show. So. Yeah, yeah. They're like I, I don't watch porn. Right? I'm like, is that possible? How could that, that be? How could that be possible? That possible? Did you not know it was free and available on the internet? <laughs> not even that. It's just like, uh, how do you get through the day? <laughs> Without it, or or the week, you know. I mean, at some point there must be a moment where you're like, I feel like watching some filthy, dirty porn. But I guess some there's got to be some people who don't. There's yeah, got to be building some people houses who don't. somewhere yeah. for for the poor. I th- look. I think it's generally. I I I mean I would never poo poo it. I think it's natural for people to want to look at pictures of people having sex from the mm-hmm. time you are able to pick up a National Geographic or a Playboy or go and look. Every kid does it, male and female. I mean, there's that natural curiosity. Um, and I've never really had a problem with it in, in like a conceptual sense. And I've looked at it and I look at it occasionally. But uh, <laughs> I, I do, my main concern is that I would, if I looked at it more, it would stop being interesting. Yeah. Bingo, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what you're going to look at more. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you've got to double up your chips, as I call it. Um, I think it's perfect timing to do self inflicted wounds. All right. So I'll, I'll keep it in the comedy world since it was a this comedy was a, story. Yeah. Uh, one of them was my fault. One of them was not my fault. And both of them took place at the comedy cellar. And uh, one was, it was a Halloween. And I've told the story before, but I, I feel like now I've come to terms with the story. <laughs> now, I've, uh, uh, it was Halloween, and back then they would do shows on Halloween. They don't do them anymore because it's a pain in the ass. People are always throwing a smoke grenade. You know, there'd be right. old people drunk in right. costume. Really, really frightening. And, uh, you know, there was people all these costumes, and we're working the crowd. The drunks, you know, heckling, all that kind of stuff. So uh, working the crowd, working the crowd. Guy comes through with two other guys. They're all wearing masks, and the guy's wearing this full face mask. And I'm like, hey, dude, what's that, like, uh, you know, the Lion King or, you know, whatever it is. Turns out he was in a horrible fire. He was the guy who needed to wear the thing because his face skin was grafting. Oh. So I felt horrible about that. Okay, that was like one of those where you're like, what the fuck right. was I? And, like, and, and no way to get your foot back out of that pile I, of shit. Like, I, I think I saw him at the bar and, like, I, you know, it was like, you know, I uh, bought him a flaming drink. No. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well go all in when you're evil. Why not? And then I laugh like an asshole anyway. Okay. But then uh, another time at the cellar, which was uh, a pretty good one, a guy started whipping bottles at me. Oh. And this is when you realize that, like, you really are a person alone. You know, yeah. like, like uh, I, I said to my um, uh, relative who was a Green Beret in Vietnam, I said, like, I kind of know how you feel, like... I go, I kind of know how it is to be like up against the wall and outgun- outgunned and outnumbered. And he looked at me like, you don't know anything about that. So <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, but this was my like, you know, moment here. So a guy, um, I said a joke about diabetes or something like that. And I guess a friend of his had died of something, something, whatever. He wasn't really listening because it was not that kind of thing. But they were talking the entire time. And uh, a guy started whipping bottles and like, it's a brick wall, and, and they would crash. And that crash stage it. is tiny. That's yeah, a really yeah. intimate space. But I did not leave the stage because it was it was my job. The MC wasn't there, and they had no security there, so they had to get the security. So I kept going like security, security. And I was like, Psh, oh Psh, my Psh. god! And then finally, you know, you know, the thing that eventually gets you is like. Why doesn't the crowd help out? Yeah, you know? no, they're just letting like, it happen. Where are all those good people we hear about? <laughs> and they were kind of enjoying the the nightmare of it because they were a bad crowd to begin with too. So, but then one or two people did get up and like kind of like got in the way because the guy got up and you know it became that kind of a scene. And you know I've had many instances where someone has gotten on stage with me yeah. uninvited, yeah. and that's always where you realize that like you know this is really just you know Dave talking into a microphone. Now it's like. You know, this could get bad. And yeah. I'm ready for that, too. But Are you? Yeah. No, I'm ready for it because I'm not going to leave the stage. Yeah. I'm not going to leave the stage unless I absolutely am told by the club owner he's got it covered. Because it's yeah. my job to hold the stage. Yeah. That's really the job. Oh. And, you know, whether you're up there juggling or telling dick jokes, 
Your job is to hold the stage until because if there's no one on the stage, then it's bedlam. Then but, it's yeah, mayhem. mayhem. Then people are walking around, and they're, it's going to be just trouble for everybody. But uh, you know, I, I've, I, I'll never forget that because I was like, "Wow, this is cool." So this is how it ends, you know, just basically getting hit in the head with a bottle, right? And, right. And you know, everybody, you know, taking pictures, and then it's it's over. And then they get yeah, they carry my cold corpse out of here. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, and, and I was always like, you know. Uh, the cool thing about it is no one got hurt, and the uh, and the cooler thing about it was like I really didn't care what the, I you know it's like I was never angry at the guy yeah I yeah. was never angry at him because I was like you know dude the guy had a bad night drinking whatever like that good thing no one got hurt but the 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 balls of it was like I got the cool story so yeah you know, yeah oh, well so it was a win it's something I say it's not fucking news to you but it's something I say all the time about on this show and is that. It, for a comic in your head, even if you were, even if the, the last light was expiring in your eye, but you were holding on to life, you'd be thinking, "If I live through this, it's gonna be a fucking great oh, right. story." Yeah. You know what I mean? That's always like at the back of your head. Sure, and like, yeah. The the point of it is when some guy who is really angry or his chick is heckling you, and mm-hmm. you know that like you just slammed her so hard that he's gonna have to say something. Like as a man, you yeah. know. Yeah, he has this is to, coming. He has to defend his woman. Like yeah. you just like I always see both sides of it. Like playing chess from both sides. Yeah. It's like, okay, if you know she is saying something, I got to say something to her, and then she's going to complain to him, and then he's going to have to say something to me, and then I'm going to have to take both of them on, and then he's going to have to stand up. Yeah, and like that's just how it is in this animal planet world that we live in, called yeah. the comedy club. So okay, you know. well, we're, I, okay. I'm going to well, ask you one last question cool, because cool. you, I know you've seen this video. And I wonder if you've ever had anything similar. Obviously not the same, but then this might have been the worst, was glass whipping out of your head. That's pretty fucking bad. But do you remember the, this video of that guy um, who gets, he's talking shit to the, he's the guitar yeah. comic, and he hits the guy in the head with a guitar? Oh, absolutely, yeah. That is probably one of my favorite things I've ever seen in my life, even though I shouldn't revel in the fact that he probably really injured that poor person that got hit in the head with the guitar. But They should show that at comedy school. If there was like a <laughs> comedy academy, they should show that. <laughs> Well, he handled it wrong. Uh, it, do you need to set up the... Oh, you no, about I'll put time. a link on the site so people can see it. But, I mean, yeah. essentially, yeah, there's a guy heckling... The, there's, a, there's a guitar comic on stage who's not very good. He's not very funny. And there's a guy in the audience heckling him. And I guess the guy... I, don't, well, I can't tell if the guy makes a move or not, but the comic decides that the guy's made a move. And he stands up and just... Wha- you just see the guitar yeah, leave frame mm-hmm. and then come back completely broken. But the audience was pissed at the heckler. The minute the guy hits him in the head, they just turn on the comic, which I, I guess is fair. It sounds like a web redemption for me. <laughs> like uh, yeah, that, that's a cool thing because uh, every, every comic looked at that and they laughed at it. But you know what? Like Everybody's always like, well, he wasn't that funny. But it's like, you know, I don't think you should be attacked, you know, no. because you're not that funny. No, you know, you're like, just it, up there it, doing your job. There's never, there's never like a, like a, you know, like a birthday clown. Like, okay, if he's not clowning enough, we should be able to, you know, stomp him. Right, you know? right, right. But, uh, exactly. Yeah, that video, like, I think shock a lot of comics. Like, oh, you know, well, and I then, better learn how to Kaibo or something. Right? <laughs> I better <laughs> step up my kickboxing right. classes. You've never had anybody try to jump you on stage. This glass thing oh, is the had, worst. Yeah, I've had all those different like kind of experiences. The, there's always the guy with the better like cool story and like the guy who tells you like the cool like you know if things get really bad you know the microphone you bang off the bottom and you got yourself a club right right like, wow how did he learn that <laughs> and then you're like this guy's right man right it's, exactly you're not up here alone yeah but I, I would say those days are coming to an end i hope because uh you know today's crowd i think they're more about judging you on the net than they are yeah oh yeah right no, no they just blow Do you, you up uh, yeah you, oh, just... you have like a cool crowd of like people into uh, you know i feel like finally your crowd is very cool by the way i'm just they, saying they're, they're okay I, I i will say that what's lovely is that most of the people that come to my shows listen to the podcast mm-hmm. or know me from archer they already kind of have a sense of who i am as a comedian so they come for that and i haven't had a, a crazy heckler in a long time i did uh, you can get the super fan. That sometimes the is. super fan is almost worse because right. you can't do anything about the super fan. Yeah. The person who's they telling like you they you. love you out loud, you can't then tell them to shut up. They love you, yeah. No, they're so happy to be there. They want to talk to you. And I always take the side of the super fan, going like, "What's wrong with these other dead fish?" <laughs> Step it up. You <laughs> That's see this a guy? Great way to go. This guy I mean, took his shirt off. What's yeah. wrong with you? I mean, come on, guys. Look at he's excited. <laughs> like he just got out of jail or something. Look at this guy. <laughs> But uh, but yeah no I had I had this conversation recently where the club was like what do you do about a heckler and I was like you know I just I haven't had a negative I had I get the super fans I haven't had the crazy person I threw somebody out of a show recently yeah you did well I just looked miserable 
you I know, just threw him out for looking yeah, miserable. Yeah, I did. Well, you know, it's like it was. I never like anybody to leave. I really, I really. Mean, I always feel bad because, like, you know, especially when it's the couple. Like, you know, I've done a lot of shows like in Utah, Salt Lake City, yeah, and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, and like the people there are super cool. Like they get like this whole thing of like you know, hey, they're religious. But like there was one couple that came down, and I'll never forget. It was like a young. Like a um, like a young Mormon couple, I, I suppose, and like they were total polite and everything. Right. But I could tell like three like inappropriate jokes in. They looked at each other and like, oh like no! Like we gave it a shot. We tried. It's way too dirty. We're going. We're two jokes away from hell. Let's get out of here now. <laughs> and I felt so bad for them because I was like, all they wanted to do was be a part of it, have a good time. And that's when I always wish, like, do you ever wish this, like? I wish I could change into like the funniest clean guy. I know, like Brian Regan, Brian yeah. Regan, Brian oh, Regan, Brian Regan. You know, like I yes. wish I was this guy. Right? They'd be loving it, and it'd be like everybody'd have a great time. Oh, I'm, I know. I'm a filthy, dirty. Oh, <laughs> hate it. You can't do anything about it. I know. That. What can you do? No, right? nothing. Thanks this for was, having me on. This was so much fun. Thank no, you for coming great. on my I'm show. Glad we I'm got stoked to actually chat. Uh, to actually have a conversation. Yeah. Well, even though you're not going to be on the porn show, I'm giving you the Dave's All Porn hat. Oh. Because now you're part of the Dave's All Porn family. I'm so excited. Yeah. I love it. I will wear this around yeah, everywhere well, but on my CBS yeah. daytime show. Yeah, don't do that. And, uh, Can I take and, a picture of you? Well, will yeah, that ruin your yeah. pants? No, that's okay. It was just my head next to like a giant penis uh, yeah, that I, I think that. was like the literal... Because <laughs> it's not like a green screen where there's like porn going behind your head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that... <laughs> you know, when we first started doing that because we have to cover everything... You know, I'd be like, make me the guy who covers the uh, taint. Right, make me right. The guy who, and then if it just came like, you know, we'd do it's a game back scene. There's like, like holes and dicks. the couch and around. And, and it's like, <laughs> give her the ball, give her the dick, and I'll take the <laughs> asshole. And, you know, I'd like, try it's and be the gentleman. Too difficult. Okay. Letterman, I think. You know, I, I would say it's debatable whether I, you know, I wasn't getting paid either. So, you know, they give you like... You know, I think back then it was like ten bucks, which was supposed to be cab fare. Right. Like at the Comedy Cellar, which is like one of the places where, like, I was uh, rejected at first, and then I got uh, passed uh, about a year later. They would give you a meal and like some food, and like that was kind of the pay. You know, right, right, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, do was there was there a moment? Because someone just asked me this question, and I and it was the first time it ever been asked to me, and then I thought it was kind of interesting. Was there a moment when you felt like you had it figured out? Oh, I never really feel like I have it figured out. I do know what I want to do. And, like, right. uh, you know, in my mind, because, you know, the people that, like, really influenced me, both alive and dead, were, like, you know, Colin Quinn and uh, Alan Havey, who... Uh, Colin you know, is going to be really upset to find out he's dead. No, no, I, I was going to say, <laughs> these are the living ones. The living ones. ones. <laughs> Plus the guys that I started with, you know, yeah. uh, you know, like, my favorites, like a Doug Stanhope or mm-hmm. a Lucy C.K. And, yeah. you know, like, uh, a lot of really great guys. And then there's the dead ones, of course, which are the, uh, you know, uh, the Bill Hicks and mm-hmm. Sam Kinison, you know, and everybody always says Richard Pryor, but I never saw him live. But right. I did get to see Bill Hicks live many mm-hmm. times, and mm-hmm. that, was, that was, like, a high point for me. Bill was, like, actually, a transcendent performer. Yeah, I, he was a San Francisco actor, yeah, too. Yeah. He played all over the country, and San Francisco was one of his, like, He was, heads. like, his home mm-hmm. base. He Bill was one of those guys that made you... Ashamed of like all everything you wrote, yes. like everything you wrote, you're like or even I'm, thought, yeah, exactly. like I don't even yeah. have good ideas, and I have poor ideas poorly executed. Whenever you watch Bill, you'd be like, I can't. Even, well, yeah. I was hanging out with him one time after a show at the New York Improv, which is no longer uh, going mm-hmm. anymore. But uh, he came over a guy's house, and like you know, we were all getting high, but he was already sober. And he saw there was a guitar, and he goes, hey, can I uh, try that guitar? And he was like a master guitar player, oh. like, just like, you know, like uh, just great. And you were like, wow, what can't this guy do? Right? I mean, like, Good he's at so everything. talented. You know? Good at everything. He had a bravery, too. I, d- is that why you admired him? Because I feel like of all the guys that – they're guys you admire because they're writers. You're guys that admire because they're performance style. But I feel like Bill had this bravery – even different than Sam's, because I feel like Sam would just kind of ram it down your throat, but sometimes it was kind of blunt force. I always felt like Bill was brave, and he was craft, like his work was crafty. Yeah, uh, that's a really good point, because I like Bill for two reasons. One was uh, he was an amazing joke writer, and when you first start out, you realize the hardest thing ever is writing oh, yeah. a joke. And the way he would just connect the dots on some of this stuff, it was just, it was genius. And then I also like him for the fact that even though he's considered an alternative comic now, like kind of the one of the forefathers of the alt scene, mm-hmm. he would play like bumfuck in the you know like all these like crazy off the grid clubs, you know the chain clubs, mm-hmm. the mall clubs, all the clubs that I played. Mm-hmm. But he was like this all comic, and he never he never would uh, you know whatever uh, he, he he never would would dumb down his material yeah. or his. Okay, so. 
I'm super excited to have you on the show. And I'm excited to be I'm here. Super fucking excited. So I'm, gonna, but uh, but you know I feel like Dave because I'm a comic. Are we have we started? We're starting. This okay. is it. There's can no I, magical things. Can I say one things. thing? Yes. This is my idea of what like a successful metro Hollywood couple's apartment would look like. <laughs> Lots of brick, you know, right? yes. forest, not much furniture, but of course a movie light in the corner. <laughs> I like that. The and mountains, the, and the, yeah, the view, the view, the, and, and also the movie light when I bought it. I was like, this is kind of a hacky light, but I, I bought it anyway. <laughs> okay, I bought it anyway. I like it. I um, like it. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Uh, because I'm a comic, I feel like I feel like there's a handful of guys who are like literally like in the comedy firmament. I mean, there's the there's like the there's like the old guys that are practically dead. There's like the priors and the that's not you. Oh, no, that's like the priors the and the Murphys, the legends. And then right of them is like Attell and like Gould and like you're 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 right there. You're like uh, like well, like a, like a mid level constellation. So I'm very excited to have you on the show. A low cloud formation. Yeah, but a good one, a, like a cumulus, like yes, a massive a cumulus. cumulus. Yeah, the kind um, you make wishes to. When you yeah, you know, or you trying to get laid. Look at that pretty cloud trying to act. As if you're sensitive. Sure. Yeah, that too. All right. But but the point is, I don't know anything about you. Yeah, Dave. I know. We've never really met. In the We've comedy. never met ever. Where did you start doing comedy? San Francisco. Okay, so there you go. So yeah. I started in New York. You started in San Francisco. Yeah. Probably by the time I was like, uh, I would play the punchline. I was just up there playing cops. But yeah. we started doing the punchline. That was like one of the first places where we got to headline. Uh, you probably had already moved to L.A. or did That seems that? about right. Okay. I might have already moved out. Yeah. yeah I so never. Did you're you always one town ahead of me. What's that? I don't know. I was, I was <laughs> fleeing you specifically. Okay. Do Not the first. You right. feel, and I had to flee because you never, no one ever takes you, uh, maybe you don't feel this way. I always feel like no one ever takes you seriously in the town that you start in because they remember when you sucked. Like right. they were, but New York yeah. is a big enough town that maybe that doesn't happen as much there. Yeah, New York, New York is like not so much about like uh, like a lot of my friends started in uh, San Francisco. Tom Rhodes, yeah, you know he's one of the big acts oh, there. Yeah. He's great. And uh, you know I just worked with Larry Bubbles Brown, who's oh, like, you know, Bubbs. Is he still list. doing stand up? Is he? Oh boy, I mean, is he? <laughs> <laughs> Was he ever? Yeah, he did. Hey, what's up, no, Bubbs? He, he, I love he's him. A lot of fun. I love him. And there's like some great San Francisco acts. I guess Jake Johansson, yeah, San Francisco act. Uh, Jake you know, Barron. Rhodes, uh, fucking well. I mean, Marin wasn't from San Francisco, but I always feel like he was yeah, a San Francisco there, act, right? There yeah, a lot. yeah, that was one of his towns. But I never really lived Patton there. Patton and Blaine and uh, yeah, all go. those guys. Okay. Brian Bussain, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good. It was a good scene. Those yeah. guys all started around when I did. Okay, so yeah. there was a lot more places to play in San Francisco than they just closed the uh, Purple Onion or whatever. Yeah, it was. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and the, what was the other? The, zoo. the Purple Onion. That was where Galifianakis did a special there, and the, there was the zoo. And then what was that other? The zoo was where I did my very first set. Oh, it was really? where I got uh-huh. my very first paid set. Okay. But remember that other place? It was like the end, West End or the half, the half Turn. It was like a place out in like kind of the sunset. Mm. They used to do a lot of improv there. The, uh, I, I yeah, really the Bottoms Up. I don't know. Some <clears> fucking <throat> shitty name. San Francisco was a great town. The the uh, the comedy was so cool. The crowds were great. Smart. Also, Matt Beard. Yeah. Wh- so you said, you, you said you didn't always want to be a comic. So what was the thing that drew you to comedy? I mean, well, other than your love of, were you? Did you grow up like being a lover of comic? Like, just I loved listening to comedy albums back then. George Carlin and uh, Rhino Records used to have all that kind of, you know, like I guess you could call it now, like you know, I don't know, it'd be like kind of like Adult Swim type, you know, right. crazy parodies and just sound effects, and I would just laugh and laugh. But uh, you know, I, I remember buying Richard Pryor albums like at the mall, and like you know, my mom would be like, "You can pick out one thing," and like, and I would buy the Richard Pryor album, and like, you know. I just couldn't get enough of it. So yeah. I was a fan, but I was not really thinking that that's something I would do. And, right. you know, uh, it wasn't until I was after college almost, like right up until the last year, I went to NYU with uh, Adam Sandler, and oh, okay. he already was a comic. And the first road gig I ever did was in Queens with Adam Sandler. I totally died. It was on dance floor at Disco. I oh. died a thousand deaths. Oh. He killed. And oh. he was just so likable. I wanted to blame the venue, right? But he, No, I couldn't, no. <laughs> couldn't do it. It was me. It was just me, horrible, and him, great. And, uh, you know, it's funny because when you say, like, do you, you know, knowing your voice and all kind of stuff, he knew almost, I'd say, right away, like, who he was on stage, what he wanted to do, his plan. And you know, give him a lot of credit. He brought a lot of good people along with him. Yeah, so, he's you know. lo- he's bananas loyal Adam. yeah he like, truly is yeah, yeah and he remembers guys. he'll remember I mean we worked together a couple of times and he's just a guy who just remembers everybody and he's like yeah. if I ever have a shot I'll give it to you and he's like very you know he has a circle of people he tries to and those guys even though life. they're film guys they're they're still at their heart comics so I think right. you know when they do movies like funny people and stuff like that yeah it's really because they kind of miss the nostalgia of 
of the whole club, you know, experience, the drama, the highs and lows of it and all that kind of stuff. The only thing is, uh, you know, they do that movie and then they get back into their helicopter and go... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to their millionaire island. Right, I can only imagine. I don't know. An island. What do I know? Or Whore Island. Millionaire exactly. Island, which is next to Whore Island, just exactly. a little jaunt away. You love that Whore Island. It's I do. So Whore good. Island. Oh. Who doesn't like Whore Island? Four days, five nights. Super friendly. Mm. Super all inclusive in every way. Sure. Uh, I, we're going to jump around. I, you, I like to go chronologically, but I want to ask you about that. About that. Because, you know, when you've been a headliner, as long as you have, mm-hmm. like, one of the reasons we've never met. Other than we started in different cities and kind of had maybe like you, you know, you're obviously you have much more accomplished than, than I am, but like parallel trajectories is I feel like you never interact with other headliners ever because you're on the road. Yeah, because you're yeah. on the road. Mm-hmm. And 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 so that that time, like that seven years or eight years, whatever, that baby comic time where you're with all your peers and you fuck with each other and you give each other tags in the back of the sure. room and you sure. like that goes away. Do you do you ever experience that anymore? Oh, well, that's that's cool. You brought that up because. You know, now that, like, we've all, most of the guys I know have headlined on their own. You know, I've done a couple of tours with guys. But now I'm on a great tour with uh, Jim Norton, Artie Lang, and we just recently had Amy Schumer, who's super funny. Oh, fun. That's great. great. And it's called the Antisocial Tour, and we just did a gig in uh, Minneapolis. But we've done, like, variations of the same tour. It's not the Blue Collar Tour. Like, we'll never get to that point. (laughs) It's, like, a fun town. Like, sometimes you play these towns on the road, you know. Misery. Where you're like, uh, you know, there's nothing to do. San Francisco, there was always a lot of fun, a lot of drinking, a lot of partying. Right. So I always love going there. And uh, one of the greatest shows I ever had there was with Mitch Hedberg, who was opening for me. Yeah. And uh, the late, great Mitch Hedberg, who's, you know, amazing comic. He died. Gone in forever, I think. But, uh he um, opened for me, and I said to the people, I'm like, why is this guy opening for me? He should be headlining. And then he became a headliner. So right, right. I would like to be, I'm the last guy he ever middled for. So. <laughs> you're, the, you're, the, you're the last, uh, the last heterosexual relationship he had before he turned gay. Or maybe the other way around. Something, something, something like that. that. Right. I, didn't, I heard your you phone beep. Can we turn, level, is it, is it your phone or is it my phone? Somebody's phone beeped. Let's make it. That was my heart. I'm was your heart. <laughs> old. I have a pacemaker, so. <laughs> uh, I, I'm prepared me. to give you a CPR. Perfect. Did you. Get um, the paddles out. <laughs> I'm just going to do that thing. <laughs> never that fake thing. shit get movies where they just out. pound on your chest with their fist. Yeah, like it's you're never going to help anybody. Get the paddles out and we're going to go canoeing or kayaking. You know, we're going to play a little ping pong before dinner. Go ahead. Were you. Sorry. No, no, no. It's, this it's is rare your, that you get to this is your hour. Super cool person. So <laughs> this you. is your, this is your. We're going to do this that my this hour? hour. Yeah, okay. this is your hour. My moment. Did you always want to be a comic? No, actually, uh, you know, I'm not a really good performer. For those of you people who, out there who've seen my act, <laughs> I, uh, I was a very stiff, um, nervous, no self confidence guy for I'd say about six or seven years into the comedy scene, and I did a lot of comedy. I mean, like every open mic in New York, I was yeah. all over it, and. Uh, you know, for me, it was like I really embraced the rejection, dejection, and um, de- defeat of it yeah. because I kind of came from that like background. I was never good at anything, so right. it felt right to me. And the people you get to hang out with, especially in the open mic when you're first starting out, everybody's like new. Everybody's kind of bad, but not bad, and everybody's really fun. Like yeah. everybody, like you know, it's like finally you find people who are, like fun to talk to. So yeah. I well, there's a, there's a nice. It, it's enjoyable, I think, at that level, especially to commiserate with fellow comics. You know, yeah. you're all in the same boat. Everybody sucks. Mm-hmm. I remember you, I used to come out of like these. There's this place in San Francisco that had like it was like a fucking la- like a laundromat. Yeah. And it's all it's all comics. There are no real people in the audience. Like you yeah. know, twenty comics and like three people doing their laundry. That's oh. why I walk out of there and be like. It would be funny. It was like, I did not get one laugh in there. Like, and it would be, even thinking about it, it was funny because it was just so miserable. There was, it was so abject mm-hmm. that there was a comedy to it. But do you feel like, I feel like that was made, made you tough. Like, those terrible sets made you funny because they made you impervious. Well, it definitely killed me inside. So <laughs> any feelings I had left were dead. But yeah, I, I think the first couple of years are good because I don't think it's so much true now because there's a lot of social media people connect, right. you know, not so much in person, but through the uh, web and all that. Mm-hmm. But it was really good for, uh, you know, like to learn how to handle a bad crowd, to learn how to handle like, uh, you know, the heckling and all that stuff. And uh, to be honest, I kind of sucked for like years and years and years. And I didn't really deserve to get paid, you know, <laughs> up until almost I did like, sensibility and he would fight the crowd every step tooth and nail. And I got to see him on the road one time and they were not digging him. And it was weird because he had already done Letterman uh, multiple times and like they could care less. They wanted him to just do the three bits that they had heard him do right. on, on something. And he had a lot more to say and he would just 
fight them. Like it was, it was great. And for me, as a guy who was going out on the road, I was like, wow, that is cool. That is balls. You right, know? right. Because balls. there is that panic, right? We're stepping into a club, you know, in Grand Rapids or yeah. fucking, you know, four points or quad <laughs> cities, you know, where, whatever. Yeah, where, where, yeah. Where you just think like. These people aren't going to get me, and and I've got to spend an hour with them, and I've got to find a way in, right? Mm. And he just never cared about finding a way in. He didn't. Yeah. Now, on the other end is Sam Kennison, who I think is one of the most underrated great comics who ever lived, because when you look at comedy now, it's pretty much storytelling and pretty low-key, kind of like smooth jazz, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I think that's cool for this generation, you know, they're all kind of like hipsters, but uh, back then, like, he was like a force of nature, yeah. and before the drugs and the fame hit, it was an angry dude who grew up in this, you know, I guess an evangelical world, yeah. and he was just laying it down and connecting to that, both the evil and the good, and like mixing it together, and I really do... Wish I had seen him live. I never got to see him. Yeah, did no, you? no, I never did. And I, yeah. you know, nothing but television. And I, I feel like I didn't become like a real consumer of, or even understand it. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I was just a beer drinker for a big part of my life. I just drank like the, you know what I mean? Like in <laughs> terms of my drink? comedy. Huh, what's that? No, no. That I mean, wasn't I'm, your drink. No, what was no. your drink? What bourbon. You? I'm a bourbon. Really? Bourbon, bourbon is my, I can bourbon see is that. my drink. Yeah. Oh. Um, but right. but in the sense of like you know that like what I consumed in the comedy world, it took me a while to like hone my tastes. You know what I mean? Like I mm. think in the beginning I knew the big the big guys and I loved the big guys, and it took me a while to find the guys that were underneath there that were like doing interesting shit. Right. You know, like Sam and I never. I mean, I, I think he died before I even really like got like to be like a real. Yeah, I really consumer. do think that he would have had a resurgence, like especially after he went through like the trial by fire of both right. drugs and to fame get sober. and up and down and all that kind of stuff. But you know, he's more, I guess you could say, legend now than he is like relevant because uh, there's not that kind of comedy. It's nobody's really doing correct. that now. You know, no. like that was like balls to the chin in your face. Maybe Stanhope does something in that well, spirit. Well, that's true. Very good right? point. Stanhope is a good friend of mine. I would say he's the last, I call him the last Mohegan. He's the one guy who will never go on the reservation. He's right. the last guy right. playing bar shows, people standing up, basically standing and just booze, puke, and piss. <laughs> <laughs> was the name of his last special was No Refunds. <laughs> yeah. So, and I've seen him so many times, you know, like we, we, I guess, first met at the Montreal Comedy Festival. And, uh, you know, Doug and I, like, I always use him as my check, uh, going, am I being a hack? Is this a, is this a hack bit? Is this a hack thing I'm doing? Because if Doug doesn't think it's hack, it's not hack. Right, so, right, exactly. Yeah. When you, so when you were a young, what, so what triggered? I was never young, by the you, way. <laughs> never, you was born <laughs> was the same, old, born, came out with a beard. An old soul, as they say. <laughs> Just came out, stroke 